Good afternoon, everyone. I can like to call to order today's GE committee meeting, Friday, March 5th, 2021. Uh, moving on to the second two remarks by the chair, Senator Flex, any comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say good afternoon to everyone. I know it's been a really long week. Glad to uh, be meeting with everyone today. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Senator. Senator Sampson, Representative Mastrochesco, any comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, delighted to be here this afternoon. Looking forward to a uh, good debate on some election bills. Uh, I will state my usual um, concern about uh, the Zoom meeting process. Uh, while less of a concern during a committee meeting than a public hearing, um, I do have some concerns that uh, you know people that would otherwise be able to come to the Capitol to access and access us and witness our hearing in, or our meeting in person. Um, just it's a matter of fact that some people don't have access to a computer or to Zoom. And, uh, and that concerns me to a little degree. I just would like that on the record, Mr. Chairman, but thank you very much for the time and I look forward to a good meeting. Thank you, Senator Representative Shesko, any comments? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chair. No, no comments, just happy to be here. Looking forward to a nice robust debate on our election bills and uh, we're ready to go. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Representative. I think we'll dive right in. We've got section three, bills and resolution for final action. Uh, House joint resolution number 58. Is there a, a JFS motion? No, no, no. Santiago, second. Moved by Representative McCarthy Bay, second by Representative Santiago. There is JFS language, which is just uh, obtained and circulated by the clerk of the committee uh, to all members via their email. The JFS language addresses the, there were two changes in the JFS language. I can review them for you right now. In line, um, let's see, uh, line number nine, there's now it says will not appear at the polling place. And the second change is the question in line 21 to 23. The question has been uh, revised and reworded. Any questions or comments? There are no question or comments. Oh, mm -hmm. Senator, Senator, Senator Sampson. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't sure whether you were asking about comments about the change in the JFS language or about the motion or discussion on the bill. Is that correct? Uh, That's the motion on the floor is to JFS the language. All right, so you're ready for a discussion. Okay, I just, that wasn't completely clear to me, probably my fault. Um, I guess I will kick off the- uh, Right, the Senator Chairman, I can just, just interrupt you. This is, this is LCO 4570, just for clarification purposes. Okay. Just, just wanna make that clear, thank you. Yeah, forgive me that I don't have it in front of me, but I did understand the changes and uh, I, they're not substantial. So let me just, um, start this conversation about uh, the bill by uh, explaining that, you know, this is a, a very, very important issue to me. Um, you know, I, I got on the Government Administration and Elections Committee uh, several years ago because I felt that um, one of the most important uh, aspects of our state government is uh, protecting and preserving the uh, system of government that we have. Um, people may not always agree on, on policy, uh, but we should always agree on the procedure uh, the system, the role of our state government, how uh, the representation of our constituents works, and you know the process by which we make our laws. And also with that, the process by which we elect our uh, representatives uh, to the House, the Senate, and uh, you know, our, our offices all across uh, the state on a local, state, and federal level. Um, and I, boy, what an education. I had no idea that it was such a complex topic. Uh, and every year I, I read more and more on the subject. And this year I got to do a lot of reading about no excuse absentee voting, and, um, which is handy because that's the, uh, the bill before us. Um, and I just wanna start uh, by making a very, very important statement to my colleagues in both parties, which is that you know, there are a lot of policy differences that we might bring to the table on any given day. But one thing that should be clear and understood by everyone is that 
um, every one of us represents our constituents to the fullest of our ability. And I think we all believe in the American concept of um, giving the constituents as much power to have their voices heard as possible. And as a result, I think we all uh, wanna see uh, an increase in access to uh, the voting process. Um, our country since its very inception has moved only in one direction, which is to allow more and more access to voting. And uh, I think that that's a good direction to continue in. Uh, the concern I have, and it is a legitimate concern, is that we must simultaneously, while improving access, we must maintain the integrity of our election process. This is so important to me. And you know, I'm afraid that that has in some circles become a partisan issue, and it should not be. We were all elected for the purpose of creating good public policy. And what I want to make clear to everyone here in both parties is that, you know, I'm going to offer some amendments today and I'm going to have some comments on the four bills that we have, which are all somewhat related to one another. Um, but only in the aspect of trying to reach that common goal, which is to make sure that um, we have the best system of government in the world, that people and voters and our constituents have the most a strong voice that they can have, and that people can trust our elections. It is so critical that people believe that our elections are accurate, that they can rely on the results. This past year, we saw a presidential election and an aftermath where this country remains divided over what happened in our most recent election. And there are some Republicans out there, some Trump supporters who to this day um, are absolutely 100% convinced that that election was stolen and that uh, there are rampant um, amounts of fraud across this country in lots of different ways. And there are um, Democrats and people that did not support President Trump but supported uh, President Biden um, who believe the exact opposite, that there was no such thing as fraud that fraud doesn't exist at all, and that uh, any mention of fraud just proves you're one of those Trump loons or whatever. And this is the conversation I have with constituents on a day-to-day -day basis. And nothing to me could be more frustrating because that's not how I do my job. And I don't think that's how my colleagues that I serve with on this committee do their job either. We are here to make good public policy and recognize that well, it's very unlikely that there was so much fraud in the presidential election that the results are mistaken, or that that type of thing happens in uh, the four corners of Connecticut. Um, the issue of voter integrity and election fraud is also a real thing, although it may not reach the level that some folks might think it does. But that's the honest answer. And I believe because that's the truth, that's the message we should be sending to our constituents. And we should be working together to make sure that the first group of people that doesn't trust the election find a way to trust the election. And we can do that by making good policy that shows them that our elections are accurate and valid. And um, we can make everyone more comfortable with the results and hopefully heal this country in the process. And, um, you know, I, I don't mean to, to, to turn this into a, you know, a lecture about politics overall, but I need uh, to make sure people understand that my objections to this legislation, which are not even strong objections, um, are based in the desire for good public policy and nothing else. I, I have no partisan uh, reason for being for or against any of the bills on this agenda. It's not how I operate. So when it comes to no excuse absentee voting, um, I guess where I would start with this is that um, if you look around the country, no excuse absentee voting is a very common and prevalent feature of elections uh, in other states. But I would note that in other states that have no excuse absentee voting, they do put significant protections in place. And the most notable one is signature verification. And uh, we learned um, a week ago when we had a public hearing uh, in testimony from the Secretary of State 
that we have no signature verification process whatsoever in place in Connecticut. Now, I think the issue when it comes to uh, absentee voting uh, versus in-person voting is that I think every one of us has to admit that in-person voting is obviously a much more reliable method. The person is standing before you, it would be very difficult, although not impossible, and there should be protections for that also, for someone to vote in place of another person. But when we're dealing with votes that are mailed in, there is a lot less ability to verify or check the authenticity of the voter. And that's just a matter of fact. That doesn't mean that all absentee ballots are fraud or it's you know off the charts. It just means that that is a real concern, that there is a lot less ability to authenticate a vote. And the question is, why are we doing this more than anything else? Which is, um, we already have a number of excuses for people to vote by absentee. Um, you can vote by absentee um, if you're in the military. And we have a, a list of reasons, um, including um, uh, your inability to appear at the polling place because of your work uh, or because you're out of town or because of your illness or you have a physical disability. Um, and it's, it is completely natural and, and appropriate that we should have provisions in place for these things because it's just a matter of fact also that we care very much about making sure that every uh, person has their right to vote and we do not want to uh, infringe upon that. And also because there are some people that just can't come to the polls. People in nursing homes, I, I would say, is the number one example. You just can't accommodate them with in-person voting. So you've got to have a solution. The thing about absentee voting is that it's historically been one, two, three percent of the total uh, vote count. And as a result, a lot less emphasis was put on uh, making sure that uh, we had proper precautions in place to fight fraud. But if we are trending uh, in a direction that is going to mean that many, many more people and a larger percentage of voters are voting via absentee ballots, we really do have to look at this and say, okay, now it's not just gonna be a fraction of that 1% of absentee voters that might be a problem. Now it's going to be a fraction of the 30% of absentee voters that could be a problem. And you know that could legitimately swing elections um, my very first election to the General Assembly when I ran for House in 2010, I won by 45 votes in a race that had somewhere around 11 or 12,000 votes. So you're, you're talking about a very small margin. And that's why every vote is so important. And it is so important to make sure that every vote is legitimate because any le illegitimate vote is erasing someone else's perfectly legitimate one. Okay, so what is the reason why we're doing this? And you know, I asked around and I, I talked to a lot of folks uh, in both parties and some constituents and people seem pretty clear that the main focus for doing no excuse absentee voting is simply uh, for convenience's sake. And look, I'm with you on convenience. I think convenience is important. We should provide as much uh, to our constituents as possible. Um, you know, should DMV be open 24 seven? I don't know. You know, if we want to get really down to what convenience is when we're dealing with our constituents, um, we could consider things like that. What are we giving up, though, at the same time? Um, and that's the question, really, is are we giving up the integrity of our elections in any way in the same process? Um, and I, I'm going to bring up a few um items that I saved just to point out that the argument that absentee voter fraud is real is not a phony argument. And I'm not doing this because I'm trying to make a mockery of our election process. I'm also not doing this because I believe that any person that works in our communities uh, as a registrar of voters or a moderator or works at the polls, I know many of those people, many of them are my friends and supporters. And um, I know that they work very hard and I know that they um, take their job seriously. Um, the problem is the process. And what I would like to do is provide them with a process that is um, ironclad and airtight that as long as they're doing their job to the best of their ability, which they do, 
um, we're going to have almost no instances of fraud or problems. Now at the um, public hearing we had, um, I made a comment uh, to the Secretary of State that I was aware of someone who was turned away from the polls in Prospect, Connecticut on election day. And uh, subsequently there was a newspaper article written about it and, I, and I've been uh, dragged through the mud on social media and so forth that I somehow made an accusation or an allegation of voter fraud that wasn't substantiated. And uh, just since we're here and many of the same people are watching, I wanna point out that um, that's not true. Um, I uh, can name the person who uh, was turned away from the polls. And I've had subsequent conversations with the registrars of voters from Prospect. Um, we later found out that the person was not a um, absentee voter at all, uh, or, or it was not that some of the, someone had voted in their name absentee, someone had voted in person in their name. And when they tried to vote, they were turned away saying that they had already voted, contacted the local town committee chair in uh, the town of Prospect who reached out to me. Uh, and I don't know exactly what happened, but they had a conversation with the moderator and that person was allowed to vote. I still don't know what happened in that case. And I know that those registrars are conscientious people who are trying to get to the bottom of it. But I just wanna point out that things like this do happen. They may be rare, but I don't think that we, uh, because they're rare is a reason not to address them. Okay, so just a few things. I don't want you to take it from me alone that these fraud things do in fact happen. Um, we had other folks at our public hearing last week, um, a couple of ladies from Bridgeport in particular who were referring to a municipal election uh, that was a Democrat primary. Uh, and they made many, many comments uh, about how uh, ballot harvesting and absentee ballots are manipulated by party operatives for benefit. And uh, in my experience, by the way, uh, since being in the legislature, anytime I hear about uh, absentee ballot fraud, it is almost always in conjunction with a Democrat primary in a major city. Um, and there are countless uh, newspaper articles to attest to that fact. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't wanna go through them all, um, but I also feel compelled in some respect uh, to defend myself because I am um, told uh, on a regular basis, there's no such thing as voter fraud. There's no such thing. Samson, you have to stop saying it. You know, it's, it's very frustrating. I, I'm not suggesting that there's rampant voter fraud that is ruining our country. What I'm suggesting is that we can do a better job at our elections. And um, I would appreciate it if people uh, took me at my word that that's what I was after. Okay, so, but I do wanna say the following things, um, which is the number one and most important uh, piece of information that I have that I wanna share with you about why I believe that we need to do a better job before we pass this um, uh, no excuse absentee voting, which is the uh, claim that you never really know who is actually filling out the absentee ballot. And um, the person that said that, and in fact, I'm gonna read their statement. It was made on the floor of the Connecticut State Senate by the most powerful person in our state government outside of our governor, uh, which is the Senate Majority Leader, Martin Looney. Um, he said, now we all, one of the reason why I think that this proposed constitutional amendment should be uh, broadly acceptable, and I would hope that it would get the kind of votes that it receives in the House of Representatives, blah, blah, blah. I want to get to the proper point. Oh, here he goes. Um, and, and make no mistake, he was very much in support of the legislation, but he said... Um, Sir, just to interject here, Senator, you're reading what now? I'm reading a, a transcript of Senator Looney on the floor of the Senate on the subject of absentee voting. It's a paragraph. Okay, and it's, it's related to the underlying bill, with all due respect? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, hey, Representative, please I mean, give me some latitude. I'm, I'm not going to speak for a long time. I, I'm really not. Um, he says, and I think that uh, absentee balloting is legitimately controversial because in reality, we never really know for sure who is casting an absentee ballot. We hope it's the person to whom it was sent. We believe in most cases it is, what we don't actually know. And so that is an issue. If we open up absentee balloting for the convenience of those who are ill or disabled or out of state on a given day, but obviously the number of absentee ballot cases of fraud that we've had over the years 
well documents the flaws in that system. So he was referring to known cases and pointing out that if we increase the number of absentee ballots by going to no excuse, you're obviously going to increase the potential for those things. And again, I don't bring up Senator Looney's comments other than to point out that this is not a partisan issue. Everyone knows this is a real thing. Um, I have numerous uh, newspaper articles uh, relating to uh, mostly the town of Bridgeport um, uh, election, primary elections between Democratic candidates, some who are serving in the legislature today, and the concerns that they've had over um, absentee ballot fraud. And I, I'm not going to get into all of them, but they're an easy Google search away. I will also point out that we've had two sitting uh, legislators who were uh, convicted and or fined for committing absentee ballot fraud. And I don't want to embarrass them, but um, Representative Christina Ayala from Bridgeport, um, back around 2014, many numerous articles about her. Um, you can read that she um, uh, committed um, several acts where she uh, said she lived in a place she didn't. And um, there's also uh, Representative Gonzalez who was fined because she was in the presence of folks uh, completing absentee ballots that were uh, fraudulent. I mean, these things actually did occur and um, they should not be minimized. Uh, and our, my own Senate colleague, um, Senator Bradley, uh, in the most recent um, uh, debate we had on this subject, which was uh, back during the special session, um, made a, a lengthy speech about his concerns uh, about uh, absentee ballots. In fact, I believe he was the only person to vote against the, um, the expansion of the uh, absentee ballots for, for COVID-19. So not a partisan issue. Um, these are genuine, actual things that occurred. And beyond fraud, there are other issues with absentee ballots that don't exist in early voting. And one of this, these things concerns me quite a bit, which, which is the notion of disenfranchising voters. It just comes with the territory that if you um, use absentee ballots versus in-person voting, there's going to be confusion on the part of some voters. Um, and we hear this all the time when we deal with the registrars and the town clerks that sometimes people, even you know, people not trying to do anything uh, funny at all, uh, especially older people who are somewhat frugal, they're trying to save money on postage and they'll put a husband and wife's ballots in the same envelope and, and send those in. Well, the problem is that in many cases, those ballots are thrown away. They are not ever even counted uh, because they are improperly submitted. And uh, those voters are therefore disenfranchised. I, I think that's a terrible thing. Um, so should there be mechanisms to allow people to correct those ballots? I think so. Do we have the means to do it in every case? And would we have the means to do it in cases where 30 or 40% of the voters are involved in an election like that? I don't know. Um, there's also been uh, a situation where many, many ballots are received after election day. Uh, it was such an issue in the primary and I don't wanna misstate what happened, but I believe that there was some, some uh, arrangement made that uh, we would count some of those, uh, those votes. Um, to me, that's not how an election is run and we shouldn't have to try and fix our mistakes after the fact. The election process should be ironclad and everyone should know what it is. So anyway, those are just my, my, my overall concerns. Um, would I like to see more convenience for voters? Would I like to see a more uh, simple process for people um, to make it more convenient for them? Uh, sure. Um, it's worth noting that we have several bills on this agenda today that are related. Uh, we have another bill for early voting and I don't wanna get off topic uh, in, in deference to the, uh, the house chairman, but I'll just say that's, you know, if you're doing one, you are providing that uh, opening of access for people who are not necessarily around on election day. Do you really need to do both things? Um, and I would say uh, for certain that I think in-person uh, early voting makes a lot more sense from a uh, integrity standpoint than does no excuse absentee voting, uh, but I'll leave it like that. And 
I'm going to, as a result of this uh, little talk that I've had with you folks, um, and I apologize for boring you, I'm going to offer two amendments uh, in an effort to, um, to help this situation. So I don't know what the process is going to be, um, Mr. Chairman, as far as how we're going to do these amendments. But um, are they, is the clerk in possession? Can we distribute them somehow? Should I just explain it? What do you think, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Senator, why don't we go one at a time? I'm not sure if the clerk has, has the, is the clerk in possession of the amendments? Yes. Have they been circulated yet? No. Senator, why don't we go one, one by one? If you want to announce which one you want to call first, we'll have the clerk circulate that one. I think the clerk, I understand your preference is to email all the amendments to each of us. It might take a little bit of a moment or two for us to kind of get, 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 get them made available to us. Yes. Okay. So uh, the first amendment is LCO 3548. And um, basically, uh, this. Um, Senator, can you, can, you, can you give us one minute until it circulates so we can see it? Oh, yes. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Why don't we just give us a moment or two here to circulate the amendment? We'll take a look, get, get, uh, make sure everyone has it before, then we'll, then we'll let you continue. Thank you. Senator Sampson, I believe the LCM numbers were changed. Um, I have 4570. I, I'm sorry, no, that's, wait. That's the actual bill, 4570. Right, that's the one that shows in the amendment I have for Senator Sampson as well. So that's, oh, you, um, you know, you're right. You're absolutely correct. It is an amendment to that LCM. I see. Okay, so I'm just going to send, um, it's marked as number one, so I'm just going to send that. Now. This, it, this one is actually number two, I believe. This is okay. the one regarding signature verification. Sure, I can send number two first then, sure. Thank you. There you go. Senator, that, that's your one to go on, Senator? Number two first? Yes, sir. Okay, oh, great. And I apologize. We tried to put together a lot of things at the last minute, and uh, we don't have a lot of practice doing amendments by Zoom. No need to apologize. We're all in the same boat. Give us one second to get it, get it, get it available. Yes, sir. Does everyone have the amendment? Would we like it? The, the clerk all set? Yes, everyone should have received it by now. I hope. Thank you. Senator, assuming that's the case, you may, you may continue. Please proceed. Um, Thank you, Representative Green. Cox. I'm sorry, Senator yeah. Sam. Just for clarification, everyone should be reading an amendment labeled exactly what by the clerk. Um, just one second. AJR 58, Samson Amendment 2. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Samson, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you guys will be very pleased to find out that it's only one sentence long. <laughs> so uh, that makes it a little simpler. This does nothing more than add a uh, provision in line 13 after the word election. Uh, it says, provided that the signature of any qualified voter can be verified by the presiding officer in the town of such polling place. So it broadly adds a requirement in our constitutional amendment that we are going to vote on um, that says that uh, it would be no excuse absentee voting, but a requirement for signature verification would. Uh, would exist. And I move adoption and I'd like a roll call vote, Mr. Chairman. 
Notice and moved. Uh, request a roll call vote has been asked for. That roll, roll, roll call vote will occur. Are there any comments or statements on Senator Tam's amendment? Representative Master Francesco, I see your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think Senator Sampson really out, outlined um, his concerns and I think a lot of us have those same concerns when it comes to preserving the integrity of our elections. And I think it's really important in today's environment um, that the public's confidence and the integrity and legitimacy of our voting process, it's really critical to the success and the public's willingness to participate, um, they heavily rely on that trust that they have in the system. We have what the, the, the amendment that Senator Sampson just proposed gives all of us an opportunity to work in a bipartisan fashion and tell the people of the state of Connecticut that we are going to, to help them trust the process. So there are checks and balances in place. We, we, I would encourage everyone to support that amendment. This is would be a first step for all of us in, in, a, bi, in a big bipartisan way. I don't believe anybody has a problem with somebody voting by absentee ballot. I think I heard in the public hearing, a lot of it really was, a, they kind of like the convenience of it. Um, and that's fine, but we need checks and balances. And it is more critical right now today and in this environment that we gain the public's trust. We have an opportunity to do that right now in a bipartisan fashion. So I'm hoping that everybody will get on board and uh, support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Representative, thank you, Senator Sams, for your comments. Uh, Representative Blumenthal, it's your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a question through you for the proponent of the amendment. Uh, Senator Sampson, please prepare yourself. Representative Blumenthal, please continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Uh, to the proponent of the amendment. Um, is there any legal reason why if we passed the constitutional amendment as proposed that we would not be able to enact your requirement by statute after when we actually pass legislation uh, enabling no excuse absentee voting? Through you, Mr. Chair. Senator Sampson. There is no legal reason whatsoever uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to Representative Blumenthal. Uh, it's simply a request on behalf of mine and some of my minority colleagues uh, that will allow us to feel more comfortable voting in favor of no excuse absentee voting. And I know that there is a um, concern about whether or not this will happen in one session through a three quarters vote, or it might take two uh, consecutive legislatures, uh, which the second one we would not even know the makeup of. So I, I'm just, I put it out there as, as a, in the effort of, of saying, maybe this is something that we can have a little give and take and work together on this proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Representative Blue, how anything further? Uh, yes, very briefly, Mr. Chairman, just a brief comment. I appreciate uh, the ranking member's response um, and understand his concern um, and respect it. My personal belief, and I would urge my colleagues to agree is that uh, his concerns would best be addressed through statutory changes once we enable uh, constitutionally ourselves as a legislature to entertain no excuse absentee voting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for the comments. Representative Fishbein, your hand is raised. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman and my Perfect. fellow committee members. Um, you know, I, I, would like to associate myself with the remarks of my, my ranking members here today, especially those comments having to do with disenfranchising uh, potentially voters. You know, when each of us goes to the voting booth on election day, or perhaps we voted by absentee based upon certain criteria, we get one vote. And we do know that sometime from time to time, there are people that abuse that system. And not only the, the examples that um, Senator Sampson brought up, but if you take the time, some time to look at some of the decisions out of the SEEC having to do with you know, individual um, violations of that, some of which are innocent, some of which are not, it does occur. And for that to occur in just one district, your own district, that you cast your one ballot in, that improper vote, has now just 
canceled out your vote. And that's not fair. I think we should all strive to try to do everything that we can to make sure that our elections are fair and they're in compliance with the law. And I think this is a good step in that direction. And I know that Representative Blumenthal had asked about a statutory provision, um, but here we're dealing with a constitutional amendment potentially. And if we're looking to have that whole package allow for the open voting of individuals, which is a right, it is a civil right, and then to assure that our individual votes are not disenfranchised by some sort of utilization of the process or misutilization of the process. That should be our goal, the way I see it. And I am in support of the amendment. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. Thank you, Representative Fishbein. Appreciate your comments and your thoughts. Any further comment? Representative Thomas, hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a comment. Um, and I thank Senator Sampson for this thoughtful amendment, but for me, it seems to go against what I've heard ranking members of this committee. I also heard it in last week's hearing that people indicated that our constitution is a document that should take on more weight, if you will. And it just seems to me in our state, you know, since the 1965 version, we've had dozens of amendments and part of that is because we don't recognize as we sit here today that perhaps we do not have the foresight or creativity to even project what might be coming down the road. So putting in something that is so specific in the Constitution, such as a signature, I think sort of negates the argument that we heard last week about the Constitution being um, too substantial to change easily. Um, you know, just off the cuff, I hear something like signature, and I know I've heard this body discuss other times about how, you know, children don't write anymore, they don't know how to write in script, etc. And I can easily imagine a time 10 years hence, 20 years hence, you know, maybe five years hence, when a signature is not how we verify someone's identity. So it just feels too specific to put into the Constitution. So I echo Rep Blumenthal's um, uh, thoughts that it seems like something that should be added to statute. Um, uh, that's it, Mr. Chair. So I would urge my committee members to vote against this amendment. Representative Thomas, any for the time? Representative Fishman, for the second time, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, I didn't know if procedurally, I don't believe this to be necessary, but I don't believe there was a second to the um, moving of the amendment. And um, if required, I, I do second that, that movement. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. I'm not certain if a second is necessary, but um, at least in the amendment, but I appreciate your, your, your thoughts and your, and your attentiveness to the process. So thank you, Representative. Any further questions or comments on Senator Sampson's uh, proposed amendment? Seeing none, I ask the clerk to please call the roll on House Joint Proposed Amendment Mark Senator, Senator Sampson number two. House Joint Resolution 58, Sampson Amendment number two. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes no. Fox. Representative Fox votes no. Representative Fox votes no. Thank you. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes no. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes no. Samson. Senator Sampson votes yes. Mastro Francesco. Representative Mastro Francesco votes yes. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes no on the amendment. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. I apologize. One more time, Representative Carpino, please. Representative Carpino still votes yes on the amendment. Thank you. Fishbein? 
Representative Fishbein votes in the affirmative. France. Representative France votes yes. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes no. Labriola. Representative Labriola votes yes. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Bain, votes no. McCrory. That means we are ready. We are ready. Panther McCrory. Thank you, you're ready. So I'm like, okay. Morin Bello. Senator McCrory votes yes. Senator McCrory votes no, I'm sorry. Senator McCrory votes no. Morin Bello. Representative Morin Bello votes no. Pom. Rob Pom votes no. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes no. Santiago. Representative Santiago votes no. Slap. Senator Slap votes no. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk. I believe everyone voted, so will the clerk please announce the tally once 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 ready? Six yay, 13 nay. Six yay, 15 nay, the amendment fails. 13 nay, but six yay, 13 nay, thank you. 13 nay, okay, thank you. Um, well, we got a further discussion. House Trade Resolution 58. Senator Sampson, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I believe I still have the floor, Mr. Chairman. That's correct. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. And um, I, I have to say that I'm coming to terms with my disappointment uh, that amendment uh, did not pass. Um, and uh, not to belabor it, but I will say that um, I'm truly saddened by it because I believe that was our, our really best chance to work together to do no excuse uh, absentee voting. And that um, I'll reiterate that, um, you know, we're gonna have another chance on the house uh, and Senate floor more than likely to have that same vote. Uh, and I would encourage my Democratic colleagues to reconsider their position. Um, if, if there's a hope to, to make it happen in one cycle with a three quarters vote, um, that would require Republican support. And uh, I believe Republican support comes from a commitment to um, uh, including some provisions that maintain the integrity of the election. And uh, just to the point that, um, you know, it doesn't need to be included in the constitutional amendment. Uh, that may be true, but by including it, you're letting everyone know that that's our intention. And um, the language is, is very broad. I don't specify uh, the exact details of, of how signature verification will work, just that we will have a process. So I'll just, I'll leave it at there on, on that subject and, and, and let everyone know that, I mean, I, I went through the trouble of, of trying to make my arguments as clear as possible that we need to work together. And um, that requires a give and take in both parties. And um, for me personally, I, I think no excuse absentee voting is extremely unreliable and extremely uh, um, fraught with potential for, for having inaccurate results. Um, and I think that's a danger to our election process. Um, but I'm willing to work with uh, the majority uh, since they are the majority. Uh, I just uh, am looking for some some help to work with them. Um, I'm going to end my comments on this subject just by pointing out uh, one final issue. I had another amendment that I was going to offer, but I don't see a point in it since it would clearly fail on a party line and uh, doesn't do any any benefit. 
but I wanted to point out that um, we have substantially changed the ballot question. Um, you folks probably know that, you know, no excuse absentee uh, voting uh, passed the legislature uh, before. I think it was 2013 maybe, and it ended up on the ballot in 2014. And uh, it failed on the ballot. Um, and, uh, you know, people will attribute the, the failure of the, um, um, uh, the ballot question on the question itself. And um, that may be true, but I believe that that question was much more honest and much more accurate than the question that is being offered in the constitutional amendment language that we have before us. And um, I just want to remind folks what the elect the question was, which was, shall the constitution of the state be amended to remove restrictions concerning absentee ballots and to permit a person to vote without appearing at a polling place on the day of an election? And um, the point there is that it's a not in-person vote. And I think that when the public understands that fully, that they are giving up on in-person voting as a requirement, except for certain exceptions, uh, it gives them pause. And I uh, think it's ironic that we're removing that requirement in the new uh, language, uh, precisely because I think it is honest and it does tell people information that is important. And um, I hope uh, folks might consider adding that language back in to let people know what the true uh, vote is about. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Um, Chairman. I uh, encourage my colleagues that without the amendment to provide protections, uh, we should vote no on wide open, no excuse absentee voting. Uh, since most states uh, at the time that they do no excuse absentee voting also take the time to put in protections to make sure that that integrity is not lessened. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate your comments. They're always very thoughtful, and I thank you for them. I, I will also thank you for your your, your call to bipartisanship, and then to the extent that we can work together, I, I hope we hope we can do so in the coming coming months and years and weeks on this bill and others as well. So I, I thank you for that. Representative Master Francesca, your hand is raised. Oh, uh, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to, um, and I won't be long. I know Senator Sampson um, pretty much outlined um, the issues with no excuse absentee. I am very disappointed that our committee as a whole couldn't work in a bipartisan fashion to put some safeguards in place for no excuse absentee voting. Um, I, I, Representative Thomas had mentioned something that um, the signature is not how we identify people. And I don't know how to other, other way to identify people. The, this committee is not in favor of a photo ID when you vote. They're not in favor of a signature to verify who you are. I don't know how else to identify a person. There, there's no other way. It's either a signature or a photo ID. So I, I find that um, kind of ironic statement. And 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 to to Representative Blumenthal's point of not being able not putting this in the Constitution. The Constitution is an absolute. It's a document that gives confidence to the people of the state. So they know that it cannot just be changed on the fly. So I think it's very critical that it is that language is included in a constitutional amendment. Again, I believe we would have had more support for it um, on that guard, regard, and hopefully maybe it would pass um, with, the, with the votes that's needed to get it done in one cycle. But for those people watching, and I don't know if they understand the process of when you go, when you vote for an app, get an application for an absentee ballot and how there is a wide open door for fraud. So before I, I say that, I wanna just mention that I often hear people on this committee and maybe during the public hearing, people saying that there is no voter fraud. And I think Senator Sampson outlined it pretty well, whether we agree with it or not, People don't trust the, trust the process. Perhaps it was because of the 2020 election. Maybe it's for the years that every time there's an election, you always wake up the next day and you read in the paper how there's irregularities in the app and the absentee ballot process. We, we are here, obviously we represent all parties, Democrat, Republican, independent, unaffiliated. Those are all our constituents. And whether we believe it or not, there are people out there that don't have confidence and faith in it. And I'm always asked the question, we're always told that there is no fraud. 
So I would submit to you that we have shown to you that there is fraud. We've seen it in the papers, in the courts. We know it exists within both parties. I would submit to you to show me where there is no fraud. I have yet to hear anybody prove to me that there isn't. Yet I think we've done a good job of proving that it does exist. Um, the, so the process for the public, and I, I think they need to be aware of this, is that in Connecticut here, we have no safeguards in place, no checks and balances whatsoever. If you want an absentee ballot, you go online, you can download an application or you can call your town clerk. They'll send it to you, you will, you will fill it out and you will sign it. And underneath that, there's a clause that says, I declare under the penalties of false statement and absentee balloting that the above statements are true and correct. And I am the applicant named above. You sign it, you send it back to your, to your town, they will send you a ballot. You will fill out your ballot, you will vote. And again, you will sign it under the same terms. You send that back to the town and there's no checks and balances whatsoever. To, to, to match up those signatures. I often wonder what is the intent of even having that on there? They don't match signatures. So anybody could sign an application, anybody could sign the ballot. And this is where the problem arises. And this is why that amendment that was put in by us is really important so we can preserve those ballots and make sure that every single vote counts and that every single one of those are legitimate. That whole process makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, many times we hear that, yeah, maybe there was one, one voter, a few voters that uh, were disenfranchised and there was some irregularities in the absentee ballot process or the voting process. But it doesn't matter because it wouldn't change the outcome of the election. Well, that really is irrelevant because every single vote should count. But sadly, in our state, we have done absolutely nothing to put measures in place to ensure that those things don't happen. It's almost like when you go to a store, you give them your credit card. Somebody uses your credit card in the store, maybe somebody working there, they got your number and they used it. You call and make a complaint. Okay, you did that. You go back into that store again, you use your credit card again, and it happens again. What happens? It's naturally, you don't trust that store, you're not going back in there. It's the same thing with our election process. People do not trust it. Um, as far as disenfranchising voters, I have to say that we have many reasons that you can vote absentee ballot today. I think those measures are good that they're in place now. Again, I have no problem expanding them. I think a lot of people really felt in this last election it was because of convenience. Here's another thing that's really ironic. You can go in to vote in a polling place today if you want to. You literally can walk in there with nothing. You don't need an ID. You don't need um, a piece of mail to prove who you are. You just walk in there and you say, I would like to vote today. Okay, who are you? My name is uh, John Smith. Okay, do you have a, some, some towns are really good about it and they do ask for ID like they do in my town. I don't have my ID. Okay, can you sign this piece of paper again under the penalty of perjury, the exact same language that you're just signing off who you are? Okay, no problem. You walk into the voting booth, you vote. And that piece of paper gets filed with the town clerk and nothing happens to it. It goes in the filing cabinet. There is no verification. Literally, anybody can walk into the voting place today and vote with absolutely nothing. It's unfortunate that this committee thinks that's okay. It's not okay in my mind. And it's not okay to the voters of the state, regardless of what party you are. I am all for expanding absentee ballot voting, but it must be done in the right way and there must be protections in place and there must be checks and balances in there. And until they, we can do that or at least make a step in the right direction to do that, 
I, I could not support this. Um, and I would encourage my colleagues um, to do the same. Uh, that's pretty much all I have on this particular topic, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for the time and thank the committee for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, further comment, Representative Thomas Rand is raised. Hi, thank you very much. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Rep. Mastro Francesco. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I represent, I don't believe there's an amendment on the floor, so I, I'm not sure. I, I, um, she, she questioned, uh, she had a misunderstanding about something I said, so I'm trying to clarify. I don't think you can ask her a direct question. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm new at this. Can on the following bill? Can I just make a comment? Yes, ma'am, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you for that correction. <laughs> Still learning, six weeks in. Um, I, I just want to clarify. Um, it was raised that I said a signature would not be a good verification today. Uh, so just to clarify what I was saying, it is perfectly valid today, but what I'm saying is that something written into a constitution should have a longer shelf life so that you're not constantly trying to amend the constitution. And I could easily imagine 10 years from now, 20 years from now, a signature might not be how we verify someone's identity. I just wanted to clear that up. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Any further, Senator Slap, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Senator Slap. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, more of a comment than a question. Um, there's a saying in uh, the General Assembly here that, you know, if, you're, if you have the votes, you vote and you don't talk. Um, and if you don't have the votes, then you talk. And, um, you know, and, and to, to kind of explain that, it's that, you know, the majority party often will sit silently and, you know, not say anything because we want to get the debate over with, et cetera. I think the stakes are too high to do that with this debate and this discussion, because we've seen that um, this, the, the impact when ultimately comments about impugning our overall electoral system are left unchecked. And so I wanna respond just to a couple comments that I heard. Um, one, that this is not a partisan issue. I wish that that were true, but we see all across the country right now, uh, one party uh, very deliberately trying to change, Georgia is just the latest example, trying to change voter laws. Um, that's one party doing that, not both. Um, two, we hear comments about that the public does not trust the uh, electoral process. I would say that if this committee as a whole wanted to do something very powerfully right now to um, you know, strengthen public trust in the electoral process, we could send a letter around. I'd be happy to write it. And all of us could sign on and first and foremost say, that President Biden won the election fair and square. And there is absolutely no reason to have any doubt about that. And having that be from Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, et cetera, would be a very strong statement. And I would hope that we would all be able to, um, to jump on board. And that would send a message that we do have a strong electoral system. There can always be improvements, but there is no reason for people not to have faith and trust in it. And the last thing I would just say is that, um, you know, there have been comments that, that every single vote should count. And that is absolutely true. That means that we need to really look honestly at our electoral system and say, you know what, how we are right now doesn't support that because in the sense that we have some of the most restrictive voting laws in place all across the country. Um, so it's not just, you know, um, you know, I mean, we have to think about that holistically and say, what about the people who are being disenfranchised right now because of our restrictive voting laws and who are working three jobs and can't get to the, their polling place or have to wait hours and hours uh, you know, in line? I mean, there are all sorts of ways that we need to make it easier to vote and it, and it can still be secure. We don't have to sacrifice um, the integrity of our electoral system. So I would just end by saying that I think the stakes are too high for the old paradigm to exist where we um, just sit on our hands and let the debate go on. You know, I asked to be on this committee on GAE because I feel so passionately 
um, about um, us enacting some real strong voting reforms this legislative session. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Senator Schlapp. Uh, for the cover Representative Haddad, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I appreciate the opportunity to address um, my strong support for the underlying um, resolution. You know, last election, um, 650,000 Connecticut residents cast their ballots using absentee ballots um, in what, what will really is a pilot program for the, the change that we're looking at right now. Uh, we were able to, to, to cast ballots by absentee um, and, to, and conduct and determine the, the results of those election results uh, fair and square um, in the state of Connecticut without, um, without, without much concern um, for, the, for the overall results of the election. There have been no complaints in Connecticut about um, any of our own elections, um, the elections of our congressional um, delegation, or even the results of the presidential election in Connecticut, despite the fact that a large number of folks in Connecticut cast their ballot by absentee. And I think that speaks to uh, the security of the system um, that's currently in place. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm struck um, that during the course of this debate, at the same time, um, a number of my Republican colleagues have consistently said that, uh, that Democrats on this committee and, and in the General Assembly don't believe that absentee ballot fraud can occur. Um, I, I don't think anybody here in this committee has said so. Um, and and I, frankly, I get um, offended when folks continually try to put words uh, into our mouths. In fact, the evidence for just the contrary was included in uh, the main, uh, uh, in Senator Sampson's uh, initial um, um, comments where he cited at least two of my Democratic colleagues um, acknowledging that, um, that 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 absentee ballot fraud can occur, um, but it but he even acknowledged that it occurs very rarely. Furthermore, nobody here accepts that um, it is currently the state of the law in the state of Connecticut uh, to punish absentee ballot fraud. Um, uh, if you conduct if you uh, are found guilty of of through an investigation at SEEC of absentee ballot fraud, you're subject to a $2,000 fine per offense. Um, if you are found guilty of absentee ballot fraud in a court of law in the state of Connecticut, you're subject to five years in prison um, and a $5,000 fine. It's a class D felony in the state of Connecticut to, 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 uh, to, to engage in absentee ballot fraud. These are statutes um, long held and long established in the state of Connecticut. And frankly, it's probably an appropriate place uh, for Senator Sampson or others to include other provisions um, that they uh, seek to uh, deploy uh, to prevent absentee ballot fraud in the future. Appropriate place in the state statute. Um, I'll finish by saying something that I think is genuinely bipartisan. Um, I heard in the comments around some of the uh, uh, amendments, a, a willingness by members of this committee to work um, to consider statutory provisions um, similar to the one that Senator Sampson proposed. And I don't personally think that that's a good idea. I don't think it's necessary, but I didn't hear anybody on our side of the aisle say, uh, reject out of hand a inclusion in the statutes of, of those kinds of provisions. Um, so I think if we're looking for a bipartisan basis to move forward, we should look at that um, and consider that um, moving forward. Last, I'll say, um, I think that uh, convenience is really an understatement. We're talking about a right, um, uh, a privilege, um, a constitutional, a constitutionally guaranteed um, right to, to Connecticut residents um, to cast ballots um, as electors in elections. Um, and convenience is, is the least of my concerns. I wanna remove barriers, um, any barrier that would, that would restrict uh, uh, voters in the state of Connecticut from casting their ballots. During the pandemic, certainly, um, you know, the, their own public health and safety was tantamount. Um, we were able to uh, open up absentee ballots uh, and, and did so safely and securely. I'm grateful that we should do that. It was a good example of what we can accomplish um, when we um, open up access to the ballots 
um, into elections. And I and we saw the turnout itself was evidence that um, uh, that it that it further enfranchised folks. It allowed people to exercise their right. Um, that I think should be the goal of everybody on this committee. I stand with both my Republican and Democratic colleagues. I'm um, saying that I think that I agree that that is our our goal. I think the the path to achieving that goal is right in front of us um, and can be achieved with a yes vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Representative McCarthy Bay, your hand is raised. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the members here today for the conversation. Uh, my mother taught me never say never or never say always. And certainly, um, I would like to concur with many of the remarks of the representative had had. But coming back to the vote that is before us today, today's vote is to place language on the ballot to amend the Constitution so that the voters of Connecticut have an opportunity to make a decision as to whether or not they would like to have access to no excuse absentee balloting. And that's what we're talking about today. I came from a state, I, my husband was in the military, I lived in Washington state for close to 10 years. And there certainly is a robust system of absentee voting in that state. There are a number of safeguards in place in Washington and in other states around the country who have for years provided a secure election system. I am very committed to working with colleagues on both sides of the aisle for as long as I'm a member of this General Assembly to assure that we are providing best practices to protect the security of our vote, to also support those who work in our towns, our town clerks, our registrars, and all those who have to administer the elections. And I believe that we have plenty of time to be able to do those things. I think we should get to work now in talking with those folks who are on the ground about how best to do that. But we know that this amendment will not even be on the ballot at the earliest until 2022. So I urge all of my colleagues to join me in support so that the people of the state of Connecticut can make a choice that they overwhelmingly believe they should have available to them. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Santiago, your hand is raised, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to mention that um, uh, this is, has been a great conversation, but I need to, again, and beg to differ that statements that have been made against that there are no checks or balances and no safeguards in the state of Connecticut uh, is telling people that the registrar of voters and people that work at the ballots are not doing their job. If you go into a ballot, if you go into a voting precinct, and you have no ID, yes, you do have to sign an affidavit saying, stating who you are. That piece of information is then taken back to the registrar's office and that, that piece of information is then checked with the voter's card that is kept in the registrar's office. So there are checks and balances. So not anybody can just walk into a, a precinct and say, I'm John Smith, or oh, I'm uh, Hilda Smith or whatever, but I have to have proof back in the office of that's my signature and that's my address. And this is how votes are counted. So there, and they, and these registrar voters with the associate registrars and the poll workers work all day and all night. And it's not just the day of election, but they work two to three weeks before that to, to prepare for any election that's gonna happen in their city or town. So I, I beg to differ that people keep saying that there are no checks and balances. The checks and balances are there. We have one of the strictest rules in the, in the whole country when it comes to voting. My daughter lived in Montana and I know I've said this before and she lived there for 15 years and everything was done by mail. People didn't even have precincts. Everything was done by mail, and there is a way that they store these signatures and do compare them. But talking about this bill, this is a constitutional change. Uh, just to remind people that we, you, we do have a U.S. Constitution. We do have a state constitution in Connecticut, and towns and cities have charters or city constitutions, whatever they call them. 
this is just to add that, that there is no excuse uh, uh, absentee ballot for people to be able to vote. This is not to micro process or micro policy the Constitution. And this is going to take a couple of years to put on there. And I think that we need to start getting more modern. Uh, you know, there are a lot of other states that uh, make it easier for people to vote with early voting. Uh, uh, in, in the country, in the island of Puerto Rico, uh, everything shuts down the day of election and everybody comes out to vote. They have a 90 to 95 percent uh, uh, turnout in the island of Puerto Rico. But in, of course, everything is shut down. Jobs, uh, places of um, where people go to work. So this does become a national um, uh, event in Puerto Rico. And it's not the same. I'm not saying that we need to compare that to Connecticut, but this is how serious people in, in Puerto Rico take their voting privileges. And I think that if we start to uh, put micro policies into the constitution, that's going to take forever. And who knows who's going to be in, in, in office in the next few years. But if you make it as simple as a question so that people understand what they're voting for, and then it's up to the legislature to put in those policies, to put in the process, to put that into statutes. And that's what we're there for. So I, I, um, I support Ms. Uh, uh, Senator Sampson's um, amendment, but that this is not the place to do it. That would be somewhere where it would be in statute uh, to be added later on. Because if we don't have anything to work on or anything to change, then we wouldn't be getting voted on to do what we're supposed to be doing is to um, put uh, issues into statute so that it makes it easier for people to vote. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you everyone for the conversation today. I'm going to fish my seat for the. I'm going to. I was going to. I was going to suggest maybe France speak first. I had not yet spoken. I'll defer to you. Where is your representative fish my? Sir, I couldn't hear you. Um, I was going to allow representative to speak because he's not yet. Well, I will allow you. You're the floor is yours. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm. I'm. I guess I'm. A level of. Not. Not distrust. Um. I'm a little bit relieved that I heard my colleague mention the U.S. Constitution because um, you know, a lot of times up in Hartford, I'm, I'm a little concerned about whether or not we all recognize that it still exists. So I, I must say that I'm, I'm happy to hear at least referenced. Um, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to go back to that process that some of us have talked about, about being able to vote just by signing one's name. So we have two different procedures we've talked about. We have the absentee ballot procedure that one can sign a test. We have that procedure where one can go to um, the polling place on election day, sign and attest. And let's just say that on um, elect, um, well, absentee ballot, uh, Amy Johnson goes to their local town hall, uh, but signs their name as Amy Jones, gets the absentee ballot, submits it under the auspices of Amy Jones, and then leaves. What procedure is currently in place to make sure that that ballot was actually submitted by Amy Jones? Representative, I appreciate the question, but I think we're getting a little far off base here, with all due respect to the, the, the uh, resolution at hand. I'm not sure if there's a way to tie your question. I think it's a little, I'm not sure if it pertains to the underlying resolution. Well, I, I we're talking about this identification thing. I know there's been objection to signatures um, and, you know, I'm just trying, you know, maybe there could be another amendment to this that, that gets us to a happy place bipartisan. So I'm just trying to understand, you know, is there some sort of procedure, um, you know, because we want full and fair elections to make sure that that was the person under, under this provision. Um, this provision allows for open absentee balloting. So 
Amy Johnson goes to their town hall to vote sometime prior to election day um, under this language that's before us under this constitutional amendment, how is it assured that it is Amy Jones who's actually voting? I think to your question, Representative, I'm not certain if this will be the proper answer or not, but I think the I think the question before us is whether or not, as outlined line 2123, well, should it be amended to present general summons to be slaughtered to ballot? I'm not sure if it speaks. I think you're getting more at the procedure, I, I think. And I, and I think this, this speaks more to the, the process by which the constitution could be amended. So I'm not sure that I get that answer to your question, but I think that, that, that's my, my, my sense. So am I to understand there is no procedure to make sure that un, under this, this constitutional amendment, that provides for early voting, that we are not providing, if early voting happens in, in August, let's say for a November election, um, we're not assuring under this question that um, Amy Jones is actually casting that vote as opposed to Amy Johnson who is present there, my scenario. I think personally, that's not part of the process. Procedurally, this is the question, well, we're going to amend the Constitution, and then it comes back to the General Assembly, should, should it be approved? So I think I'm not saying that. I think that's a statutory debate as opposed to uh, what's before us right now. So procedurally, I think those questions ultimately could be addressed, but not, 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 not in the resolution before us. Okay, it's not addressed at all. That that scenario is not addressed at all in what's before us. Uh, that's correct. It's not. It's correct. Okay. And then, you know, I do note that just to get to that statutory claim, we can deal with the statutorily. Um, I think some bills have been put in to deal with voting by identification, that kind of stuff. When am I to expect we're going to have a public hearing on those bills this session? I don't answer for you right now, sir. Well, so we're hearing that we can deal with this statutorily. There are bills that are out there to deal with this statutorily, and we're not going to deal with it this session. Is I, I just. I'm new to this committee, so I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. And I appreciate it. I think you're asking, we're trying to remain, we've allowed a lot of, much latitude to the committee members thus far about this debate, and we're asking, I think, to, to, we're going to have to kind of bring our focus back together. I think the question you're asking is outside, separate and distinct from the resolution before us. Okay, I, I take it from your answer that those bills aren't going to be addressed, but um, it's discouraging, but um, well, it's not discouraging, it's a little hard to swallow, but anyway, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Representative France, your hand is raised. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm gonna make a couple of comments from um, in relation to constitutional uh, provisions for uh, early voting versus statutory. And, and unless you dive into how each state has their election law, it's, it's difficult to compare state to state. In our case, we have provided in the constitution the requirements for uh, our election process. In many other states, it's all statutory. There's no provision within their state constitution. And so that's a fundamental difference in how we approach. So we should be putting into the constitution the structural provisions uh, for that. And I appreciate uh, my good friend, Representative McCarthy Vey to bring up Washington State uh, and their voting process, because they are one of five states in this country that do all of their voting by mail. And part of that process is a robust signature verification process, hence the merit on the amendment that was provided earlier and failed uh, in this committee. That robust signature verification process validates that that ballot that comes in by mail, and it is then electronically verified, the signature matches the signature that was made when that person came to register to vote. And now that validates not just that the ballot came from an address or came from a person with a name on it, but it validates that the person who signed it is the one that is named on the ballot. And that is the provision that they use. So I, in the five states that do all their balloting by mail, all have electronic signature verification processes. They also do their voting 
requirements by statute. We do ours in a constitution. So therefore, we should have the same provision in our constitution that they are using since we are, are looking at essentially a vote by mail process under the construct of the early voting wide no excuse absentee balloting. It effectively is a vote by mail process. Uh, since you can go online, you can request your ballot electronically, the ballot is mailed to you and you can mail it into the, the town clerk. So I, I wanted to point that out that we, we need to be clear with the public on when we compare state to state on what the provisions are because not every state provides for how they govern elections the same way. And we say we do it by constitution with statutory uh, addendums or details. Uh, many states, most states in fact, do it all by statute and have no constitutional provision. So I would argue that we should have the structure and have the signature verification process as part of that, as part of our constitution, given that that is a, a, a hallmark of our state and that voting is regulated by the constitution and enshrined there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Any further comments or questions? Senator Flexer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I appreciate the debate this afternoon on the first uh, item on our agenda. Um, I just wanted to say briefly, first of all, um, you know, this is a conversation that we've had in this committee uh, for quite some time and in the General Assembly for, for quite some time. And I think this is an important measure that we have before us. And I understand there's a, a, a strong difference of opinion within the makeup of this committee with regard to whether we should be adding more language to the Constitution or whether we should be taking these structures out of our constitution and allowing the debate that we've heard here this afternoon to always be a legislative debate, that these uh, measures would be um, in state law instead of in a constitution that would make it very difficult for us to change in the future. And the constitution is difficult to change uh, by design, but I believe on this measure and on the other measure that we'll debate in this committee later, uh, that the people of Connecticut are frustrated uh, by our current laws, uh, our current constrictions of our laws that caused by these constitutional provisions. And, and I'm grateful that we're debating um, this change in this committee today and hopefully in the full House or Senate too. Um, I, I appreciate many of the comments um, made by my colleagues on this committee on the Democratic uh, side of the aisle, and I uh, agree with what they've put forward this afternoon. And I also appreciate the comments of some of our Republican colleagues this afternoon. Um, I would just say two things in response to that, to those comments. Um, first of all, I think we have to be very careful when we talk about fraud, and I would encourage anyone who's on this committee or anyone who's watching the debate in this committee to please follow the process that was outlined in this discussion. If you have an instance where some one committed voter fraud to your knowledge, you need to report it to the State Elections Enforcement Commission. That is where an actual adjudication of fraud can take place. Not just allegations, not just statements that I know this thing happened in such and such a place. Please report it. We do take them seriously. We have deep trust in the State Elections Enforcement Commission and I know that they do a thorough job in investigating those kinds of incidents. We need those things investigated so that we can all continue to have trust and faith in our electoral process in Connecticut. And in Connecticut, the State Elections Enforcement Commission in recent years has found very few actual cases of voter fraud. Again, fraud being determined by the commission, not just something that people choose to say or use as, as an expression, but something that's actually been thoroughly investigated. So again, I would encourage people that have those kinds of concerns to come forward. They will work with you and take the evidence that you have um, and be sure that any instance is treated seriously. Um, and I do appreciate the, the effort this afternoon to work together. And I pledge uh, as long as I am working on these issues to work with our colleagues on both sides of the aisle when it comes to the statutory framework that will hopefully come after this amendment is passed by the General Assembly and voted on by the people of our state. I think we can have a robust 
conversation on exactly what the statutory language will be moving forward, something that can give all of us confidence in a new process for absentee ballots to be available uh, to more voters in our state. But um, in general, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that this is a, a, a change that we're debating this afternoon that many people in Connecticut have been asking for for some time. And I think it, it is an important measure for Connecticut to be at the forefront of making sure our election systems are open and accessible to as many residents as our, of our state as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator, for your comments. Seeing no further questions or comments, uh, will the clerk please call the roll on House Joint Resolution number 58, House Joint number 4570. House Joint Resolution 58, LCO number 4570. Yes, Senator. I'm sorry. Is that, this is uh, uh, to, to JFS language on the floor. Yes. Uh, uh, well, this is for LCO number 4570. That's correct. Um, Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes yes. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no. Can you see me, Madam Clerk? No, I can't. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein votes no. Can you see me, Madam Clerk? Not yet. Uh, we'll, we'll I try. Can see Sorry. Okay. There we have. Come on. Can you um, repeat it one more time? Maybe it'll zoom into you. I'm sorry. Representative Fishbein votes in uh, negative. Thank you. Thank you. France. Representative France votes no. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola votes no. McCarthy Vahey. Representative McCarthy Vahey votes yes. McCrory. Senator, Senator McCrory votes yes. Senator McCrory votes yes. Thank you. Morin Bellow. Representative Morin Bellow votes yes. Tom. Representative Tom votes yes. Rosario. Rep Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Representative Santiago votes yes. Slap. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Clerk. Will the clerk please announce the roll? Uh, 13, 13 yay, 6 nay. Bill passes. Thank you. Moving on. Um, I think before we uh, proceed, I just want to make a quick comment. We've allowed, um, thus far, we've allowed some great deal of latitude uh, to individuals, on all members of the committee, on discussion and topics that have been discussed and presented. As moving forward, if possible, we just try to maintain the focus on the underlying hand. Maybe we value you and uh, really, really appreciate your your assistance in that. In that. 
Next, we're moving on to uh, item subsection, item number two under subsection three, House Transit Resolution number 559. A resolution approving an amendment to the state constitution to allow for early voting. Motion to JF, is there a motion? So moved. Santiago, second. second. Moved by Senator Flexer, second by Representative Santiago. Any comments or discussion? Representative Master Francesca, your hand is raised. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple questions on this. I understand this is the exact language that we voted on in 2019, correct? That did correct, not yes, pass. And now understanding, so people understand if it passes this time, it will be on the ballot in 2022. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Uh, it passed, it does not, not pass in the necessary uh, number. So it passed in the House. Uh, 125 voted for, 24 members voted against it in the Senate. I forget what the actual roll call was in the Senate, but the Senate did not achieve the three-fourth majority. So uh, it did technically pass, and now it's back for us. If it, if it passes again, it's on the, the uh, ballot for 2022. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. for. for I just wanted you to re, uh, refresh everyone's memory who's not familiar with it. I do have a couple questions on in here. On line number 47, it actually starts on line 46. Um, it says uh, one list shall be delivered within three days to the town clerk and within 10 days after such meeting, the other shall be delivered in the word under seal to the secretary of state. And it was re, um, and it was that language was taken out. Can you explain that to me? I can give me one second, I believe. Yeah, this is when the votes on the when they're certifying the votes, they have to be delivered yep. to the Secretary of State. I believed in the past they were delivered under seal, if I'm understanding that correctly. And now that language is talk is taken out. So I guess what I want to know is what it what was the process before? What is under seal and why was it removed? I believe that has to do with the fact that this is addressed elsewhere in the statute. And I, I always am reluctant to defer. LCO, but is that, is that correct LCO? I'm reluctant to defer to you, but I think that's that's the correct analysis, correct? Uh, so there are provisions that do speak statutorily, that do speak to how uh, those votes do get sent up to the Secretary of the State's office. Um, I'm reluctant to speak to, to the intent, um, but there are provisions that do speak statutorily to the transmission of those numbers to the Secretary of the State's office. So, so through you, Mr. Chairman, um, what does under seal mean? Exactly what, what is done? Can you just explain this? I'm just trying to understand it was taken out and why. What is the difference? I believe that I believe that the um, the seal is, is dead, as, as I'm sure it sounds, is the old time fancy kind of wax seal. These views that we then no, no, no longer used. So I believe that's why the language has been removed. Are you saying that so it's no longer it needs to be like through a notary? Uh, is, that, is that what you mean by that? Through you, Mr. Chair? I mean, I, mean, I think there's no longer, they don't physically use the old time wax seal to, 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 to mark, 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 mark the return. I believe that's, I believe that's the reference. Okay, so there's no, no difference. Longer. There's no difference in the process. That's correct. I think there's just the times have changed and there's no longer no longer no longer used. Okay. Um, hold on a minute. I have a question here on on lines twenty two of the bill. That's correct. The yep. Resolution it says the General Assembly may further provide by law for voting in person prior to the day of election in the choice of any officer to be elected or upon any question to be voted on in election by qualified voters of the state. Can you explain to me exactly what that means? Um, of course. The it will allow for um, in-person voting prior to election day for any person up for election or any, if there's an, a, 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 a referendum item, like a, a, um, a decision that needs to be made by the voters on the ballot, 
uh, to made at an, at an election by a qualified voter of the state. So just to allow, allow for in-person voting prior to election day on any matter that's on the ballot. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and Mr. Chairman, it says what concerns me is the General Assembly may further provide. I guess what that, that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, currently, right now, that would really strip language out of our Constitution, right, and give more authority to the legislature to allow them to make changes on the fly. So I guess what it would be the exact um, responsibility of the General Assembly based on the way it is written written in that line. So will be the responsibility of this body if this resolution passes up your ask. Yes, 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 Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I believe if, if, if this passes uh, pursuant, if the voters of the state of Connecticut are in support of the question as outlined in lines 87, 89, uh, the General Assembly will be uh, provide the ability to make changes to allow for in-person early voting. Okay, so th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so the General Assembly would meet and they would be able to make changes as they want to or as they see fit on anything um, that regards early voting. Uh, procedurally, if, if this resolution passes again and the Constitution is changed to permit for early voting, the Manner by which that early voting is going to proceed will be put back into the will be the responsibility of the General Assembly. You and I and others who are still, assuming we're all still around then, uh, will be given the responsibility to, to outline and set up the structure and put a structure in place by which early voting is going to uh, be implemented. So yes, the, the General Assembly will, will will be the body uh, to put the procedures together. And would what I would assume one of those procedures would be a time frame. What concerns me on this on this particular resolution is um, there's no time frame. Usually there are a few days or a week out. Um, obviously, bigger states maybe do 30 days, but we're a small state of 3.5 million people, and it doesn't determine a time frame. And that's what really concerns me on this. I think. You know, people go in, they can do early voting now. They can certainly just go in and uh, vote by absentee. But with no time frame in here, it's a concern. And I think that should be included in here. So I'm just concerned. I mean, has there been any discussion on time frame, or is this one of those things where, you know, we pass it now, it's, um, and it'll pass again, obviously, and then we worry about the statute later? Is that the intent? The I, the, that's that's the process by which it would happen. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Assuming this passes, we back up to the members of this body to put in place a procedure by which early voting is to be implemented. Okay. Um, I I would just say concern on this. When this came through in 2019, I didn't vote in favor of it. Then um, I certainly can't support it now, only because there is no time frame in here. We, it certainly could have been written where it's five days, three days, a week, or whatever. And then I'm also concerned that it strips, you know, that our constitution is the people's document. That's where they have all the authority and all the power because to change the constitution, we need our people to get involved in the process and they make the decision on what should be changed. This particular resolution strips that um, authority away from the people because now they will never be able to go back to the constitution and, and make those decisions because it's been taken out of their hands and put into the legislature. And that's where I have concerns on this particular bill, particular resolution, excuse me. Um, I won't belabor it. I, I'm sure other people have questions, but um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate your comments and your questions. Up next, Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start by just um, reiterating the, uh, the very thoughtful and, and great comment by my co-ranking member um, that the concern overall, I mean, there are a few things we can talk about, but overall, it is much like the previous bill. Our concern lies not so much with instituting early voting in the state of Connecticut. It is the process, as was mentioned, which is that we are effectively taking what is the sacred uh, document of our state constitution where we put the most important framework for how 
our state is run and we are uh, eliminating um, that significance by transferring it to a simple majority of the legislature. And instead of a vote by the actual public, um, and effectively, this constitutional amendment will, will take out the fact that voting is a one-day uh, provision uh, forever from the Constitution, uh, unless somehow there is another constitutional amendment to put it back, um, and instead say that the legislature can change um, our voting laws and um, any way they choose, any time they choose, without the people's consent. Um, now, that's not to say that the people don't uh, elect our representatives and each one of us uh, work for them, um, but there is a reason why we have a constitution. And um, as uh, the Senate chairman uh, stated very eloquently that, um, you know, it's difficult to change by design, although that's a somewhat ironic statement when we have two constitutional amendments that are gonna change the same section of the constitution on the same agenda and we're gonna pass one this time around and maybe two this time around and then another one two years from now. It doesn't seem like the constitution's too hard to change uh, based on that. Um, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to have this conversation about this bill because we just had a similar conversation on the last bill and it seems like the concerns uh, made by myself and other members of the minority were completely discarded as unimportant because we can worry about that later, Senator, don't worry. We don't have to put that in the constitution. But I disagree. And you know, I disagreed in the first case because you know, we just had a huge absentee ballot election you know, and no signature verification was involved. You know, so wouldn't it have been smart to put that in place first? I guess that's the issue I have here too is that we're not doing things in the right order. You're gonna change the constitution, we should have an idea of what we're changing it to. And we should tell the people honestly what the plan is. So with that, I'll ask the same question that my uh, co-ranking member asked. And forgive me, uh, Mr. Chairman, for asking this question of you, because I know you're probably not going to give me an answer. But just for the record, what is the plan? Is there a period of time that is being considered for how long early voting will be? Uh, thank you, Senator. And um, there is, in the resolution before us, uh, there is no set time frame. Right. And the so, resolution before us just, just, just permits the General Assembly to provide for, to allow for early voting. So in the current resolution, there's, there's no, no set time frame. I understand. Thank you. And would anything preclude a time frame that is 30 days being adopted by the legislature based on this constitutional language? You're asking if, if in the future, assuming this passes, is there anything in this resolution that would, that would prevent it from being 30 days? That's correct. Uh, there, again, there's there's nothing in this uh, resolution that addresses any time frame. Just uh, addresses the uh, general assembly being being allowed to uh, set up early voting. So there's there's no, nothing that speaks uh, as the time frame provided. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that answer. So I assume it's the same answer if it was 90 days. Uh, again, there's no, there's no time. This is simply would simply allow the General Assembly to implement uh, provide for early voting. So there's no no no, no time frame mentioned. Okay, thank you. I, so so it's very clear. I mean, the General Assembly will have the uh, complete authority to determine how long early voting is. And um, you know, I said I said it jokingly uh, at the hearing, um, but that means that you could effectively institute early voting that be in, begins on the day preceding the last election. Um, in fact, I don't even know if you could say that the previous election wouldn't count towards the next election using this language. Um, that may seem absurd, but that's the reason why you do not put absurd things in your constitution. You want parameters that the people understand that are common um, sense and, and, and clear for them. So that's just the start of the questions that I would have about the process. When you have multi-day voting, that necessarily means that something has to happen with the counting of those votes. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, is there any 
um, conversation or plan about how the counting of votes will occur? Will the counting of votes take place daily and be announced or will that be kept a secret? Do you, Mr. Chairman? Again, Senator, are you asking if there's been any conversation assuming this passes about future act, future statutory changes? That's correct. I've had none. Thank you. And so can I, without dragging this out and asking you a lot of unnecessary questions, uh, can you also tell me whether there's been any discussion about the cost of uh, such a, a plan? If it's 30 days or three days or 180 days and whether how it's gonna be implemented, how the towns will be able to accommodate this change? Uh, so I've had no such conversation, I think, because part of the process, part of the problem or the issue that we've not yet established that time frame, but I've had, no, I've had no such conversation at this point. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what I'm trying to do is, is paint a picture of what my concern is overall, which is that we're going to go out and we're going to put this on a ballot to the citizens of the state of Connecticut. And, you know, I think if you ask people casually who are not invested in making good public policy, but they're just average people working and going about their lives. And you say, would you like more convenient early voting? They'll say yes. Um, but they'll also in the back of their mind have a belief that we have done our homework and that we're going to pass early voting in some sort of way that makes sense where we've pondered what's going to happen with how the votes are going to be counted or how long the period is going to be and how the towns are going to be able to afford staffing the polls, et cetera. And we haven't done any of that. And in fact, all of that is completely up in the air. And I want to just take a moment to let people know how important those other completely ignored questions are that will never be told in advance to the public before we say, hey, how would you like free money? You know, how would you like early voting? It's completely unfair without having the, um, the, the backbone, the, the structure beneath it, in my opinion. And um, just, just for example, a election that has three days early voting is much, much different than one that has 30 days early voting. And I, I believe there are states that have 45 days early voting. I would also note, by the way, you guys might not realize this, but many states that have employed early voting have actually gone back and reduced the amount of early voting that they have after putting in 45 days. They've said, oh, that's too long. We shouldn't be doing that uh, for many of the reasons that I will get to in a moment. I'll also point out that uh, if you study this subject, both no excuse absentee voting and early voting traditionally in um, study after study, reduce turnout. The, the notion that somehow we're making it more convenient is going to let more people vote is not true. Uh, the facts say otherwise. And that's not in every case, but in the majority of cases, and if you read these studies, nonpartisan, just analysis of the situation, you find out that less people vote. And I think that has something to do with getting away from the significance of having election day be an important day for all of us to put emphasis on. I think when you start to do um, early voting 90 days in advance, for example, what's gonna happen is people are gonna be like, well, I'll do it next week. I'll, I'll do it when I get around to it. I also think that you run the risk of having people make poor decisions on who they're voting for without all the information because you know a campaign can't necessarily put out all of their information 90 days before election day or 30 days before election day, an election has a life of its own. We all know this from running our own campaigns. And we might have some you know, really important issue we wanna stress in the final week or the final days of the election. And what about things that happen? I, I use this example at the public hearing. What if you were gonna choose one candidate for president who was really, really good on the environment because this is what you care about more than anything but then suddenly we are involved in a war. Maybe you say, oh my, the other candidate, I have way more confidence to manage our situation during wartime. You have reasons why people might change their minds that are completely relevant. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, is there any contemplation about uh, people who have voted early being able to change their votes? Uh, Senator, without sounding too um, repetitive, I, I, and I think you're asking, you're asking if there's the current amendment, the current resolution for us uh, provides that the General Assembly be permitted to provide for early voting. So uh, there, there's no, there, there's, uh, the statutory fiction, fixes, statutory language, which I think you are referring to or implying at is not included within this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Take, for example, what if we were, uh, Governor Cuomo was up for re-election, uh, you know, a week from now, and people voted uh, 30 days ago uh, by early voting. Um, some of those people, I can guarantee you, would probably have a different opinion about whether to vote for Governor Cuomo today. Um, and I'm just curious whether there's any provision for allowing people to go and switch their vote. Um, I suppose that will be contemplated later, and we will tell the people after they've already voted for early voting whether that's possible. Um, I briefly mentioned the cost to towns, but there is a significant cost to towns just to have the magnificent staff that we've all talked about. And I concur with the comments of my colleagues that say that the people who uh, work our election day process are amazing people who are making a big sacrifice. And I have great confidence and faith in them and I'll reiterate that all of the commentary about election issues is about the process and not the people involved. Um, and that should never be taken out of context. Um, but there's a lot of cost involved. It's not just the manpower either. It's, um, you know, where is the polling location gonna be? Uh, Mr. Chairman, is there going to be a central location for voting early? Uh, based on this resolution, there, there, that's not included within this resolution. Okay. Um, so that's another question that has to be answered. You know, will there be mo multiple polling places? Will you only be able to vote at town hall? People, I think, would want to know that before they cast their vote for whether early voting is in place. Um, there's also a big concern I have about the way we count votes. This is critical to me because you really have only two choices if you have early voting. And if that's true, if you have three days or 30 days or 180 days, doesn't matter. Somehow you have to handle the fact that people are voting and you've got to keep track of that. So you either have to, number one, you have to leave the tabulator machine open, which means that people who vote, we don't close the machine because we don't want to tally because it would not be good for people to, to know the results of the first day's election or the week later's election um, until the end, or you've got to actually uh, close the machine each day and run a tally. But then you have a new set of problems because someone when has to keep track of that information. And then what's the likelihood of that information reaching the public, being put, put out in the news media, and what impact that has on the ultimate uh, election results? Um, and I won't even bother asking the chairman because I know this is not been contemplated. Um, you know, in the, uh, in the most recent election, the Secretary of State took it upon herself to implement uh, drop boxes. Um, it's another concern because in our election process currently, one of the things we do um, is we do our best to make sure that there is a continuous chain of custody of the ballots. Um, and again, to the point of the great people involved, as long as that chain of custody exists, I believe that our folks working elections are doing a great job to make sure that no, no funny business is happening. But when you eliminate the chain of custody, this is a process issue, which is what I'm drawing attention to once again, um, the process presents a problem when you have drop boxes that are not monitored. Um, I have seen photographs of our drop boxes from the previous election stuffed so full of ballots that they didn't, they were not in the machine. Um, that's a problem. What, what happens if someone comes along and takes those ballots? Uh, and it's been discussed. What if someone vandalizes a, uh, a drop box, things like that? You're just creating a, a whole new uh, set of concerns that we are not addressing today just by asking a simple, broad question, which 
almost anyone without any additional information would be in favor of. I don't think that's a fair thing to do to the people of the state though. Um, a lot of conversation about signature verification and how we might need identification verification uh, as, a, as something uh, to improve upon that. Um, and I, I like that idea that we should we should have some sort of identification verification for voting of all kinds. Um, and currently, uh, we just for people watching, we have a voter identification requirement for in-person voting, but it does not constitute a photo ID. You know, it just requires some, a, um, a even an envelope from the uh, electric company or something. Um, and as was pointed out by my colleague, Representative Master Francesco, you can vote. Uh, in person um, on election day without stating, uh, without even being registered or having ID, as long as you're willing to sign a statement. Um, I would ask the chairman again, although I already know the answer, which is, are we going to allow that same uh, policy of election day registration at the polls if we have early voting? And uh, would there be some sort of audit of those people that indicated that they uh, did not have ID, but they swear who they are uh, to make sure that those were legitimate voters. Um, these are just the beginning of the questions. Um, there are way, way more questions that would have to be answered if there was a focus on making sure that we wanted to do early voting in a responsible way. Um, I will just, I have uh, two amendments I'm gonna offer, but or rather three amendments, but before I offer them, I just wanna state that I'm not against early voting. I um, do have some concern about the reports I mentioned that shows that it actually, in some respects, can limit um, the uh, importance of, you know, election day is, is a very important day for all of us and somehow drive down uh, the participation. I don't wanna see that, but I am open to the notion of early voting from a convenience standpoint but I have my reservations and I find it um, uh, objectionable that this body would put a question on a ballot um, which allows the majority party in the legislature, whoever that happens to be, to write the election laws any way they choose without going through the people as is currently required by our constitution. As uh, Representative Mastro Francesco pointed out, this language basically um, nullifies the language about voting in the constitution because it says, that doesn't matter anymore because the constitution's house says, we don't care, it's whatever the legislature votes for. So the process by which we used to change it, which requires this long process and a significant majority and confirmation by the people is gone. It will be eliminated by this language and replaced with whatever party's in power gets to do what they want. I don't think that's a um, wise uh, policy choice. And I can tell you, even if I was in the majority, I wouldn't support it because I would see the danger in it. So with that, Mr. Chairman, let me offer the first of my amendments. And uh, these should be labeled uh, HJR 59, Samson 3, 4, and 5. So we'll start, first. Yeah, we'll start with number three, Mr. Chairman. Can we, can the clerk please uh, circulate the Samson Amendment number three to the committee? Yes, Mr. Chair, I just sent it. Give us a second, Senator, we'll be right with you. Mr. Chairman, I am very, very sorry, but I had the order of my amendments incorrect. And uh, the amendment that I would like to call is item number four, actually. So you're, okay, so you're gonna now withdraw the prior amendment, but you'd like to? Yes. Okay, so you're I, withdrawing the prior amendment? I withdraw it currently, yes. I may call it after this one, but okay. right now I'd like to call amendment number four. So will the clerk please circulate amendment number four, for Senator Sampson? I don't need that. Just procedurally, I don't think I need to withdraw anything because okay. I didn't make a motion. 
Understood. I just sent it, Mr. Chair. Senator, give us one second. By all means. Senator, so I want to make sure I have the correct one in front of us. This is having to do with line LCO 3599, line number eight through 10 makes reference to valid photo ID. Is that correct? You're on mute, Senator. That is correct, Mr. Chairman, although I believe the uh, amendment number three also changes that same section. Uh, lines 18 through 22 refer to uh, specifying the days of early voting, though. Understood. Thank you. Uh, so long as everyone has an objection, please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So this amendment does two things. Um, and first and foremost is those lines 18 through 23, which does nothing more than modify our constitutional amendment before us to provide for a specified number of days of early voting. And obviously this is debatable, but the amendment that I've offered is what I believe is a reasonable compromise um, that would generate Republican support if we could make it happen. Um, and that is um, to specify uh, three days of early voting within five days. Um, and not to be confusing, but what that would allow is an election that consists of Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or a Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, or even a Friday, Monday, Tuesday, in an effort to accommodate uh, the public's uh, convenience to be able to, to come and vote. Uh, and I believe that is a step in the right direction. I think it's much more fair to ask the public if they would like a time frame of early voting rather than an open-ended question, which could be 180 days, uh, presumably. Um, and, I, and I also get the, the fact of just mentioning that, that, that maybe no one on this panel wants 180 days, but by changing the constitution and putting in hands in the legislature, some future Democrat or Republican majority could do whatever they want. Um, the other port, part of this amendment would be um, in the same vein as the signature verification in the previous uh, bill, uh, which is to ask for valid photo identification um, at the time that um, uh, voting uh, in person. Um, many, many states have photo ID. Um, there are a lot of arguments that have been made in the past against photo ID being uh, voter suppression. Um, I Forgive me for being flip, but that's just nonsense. I think anyone that argues that someone's too poor or incapable of getting a photo ID is just telling a story out of school. Um, it's insulting, in fact, to me, to uh, populations that uh, might be told they're, they're not capable of getting one. Um, and I have proposed a bill every year to accommodate uh, folks getting a, a valid photo ID uh, from the state. And if they don't have the means that uh, one would be provided to them. So there's, there's really no reason why you cannot have photo ID you need a photo ID to drive a car, uh, to get on an airplane, um, you know, to donate blood, to pick up a prescription, to apply for unemployment or social security benefits, uh, to go to the package store, to buy cigarettes, to get a fishing license. I could go on for hours listing the things that you need 
a photo ID for. And the fact that we don't require that for something as important as voting is shocking to me. And I don't think it's a hard leap or a ridiculous request on behalf of um, the citizens of Connecticut to ensure the integrity of elections to say, let's put the number of days in the actual constitutional amendment and let's put a requirement for photo ID. And with that, I move the amendment. I'd ask for a roll call vote and I would urge the adoption by my colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, I have a motion to move roll call vote on request. We will vote by roll. Um, just to clarify uh, the procedure here, Senator, what you're, you're asking for is should this amendment pass, the underlying resolution be revised, we're back to square one, essentially with the resolution in terms of voting and procedures in the House and Senate, and that it have to pass by certain number of majorities in order to get the ballot in 2022? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. However, I would suggest that the likelihood of getting to three quarters uh, is much more uh, possible. So it could happen in the same time frame as the current amendment. I would also point out that there is no obligation uh, since you could still run the current amendment. Um, and uh, you know, presuming the uh, you don't get to three quarters on the uh, this particular language, you could do it the other way. So just just throwing that out there, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And in lines, if I may, in lines 72 through 76 of the questions that would be asked, that would be on the ballot, is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize that that language is not highlighted. Uh, it probably should be in this document. So should this amendment pass, we would be, we'd be presenting the voters with two different questions? That is correct. And in terms of the process by which lines eight through 10 address the voter ID portion of your amendment, I believe. I believe that's, uh, that, that, that's the only section that addresses the voter ID requirement. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And that would. Has there been any thought? given to um, individuals who don't have an ID? Do, do, does this resolution address that at all? If, if someone didn't have an ID? Uh, as has been previously discussed, Mr. Chairman, uh, that is something that we would do in statute. This sets the broad guideline that photo identification would be required, but we would specify how and uh, whether or not the state would be willing to provide them to folks that uh, do not have it. And I would be very much in favor of that as indicated. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Uh, further questions, Senator Hassel, your hand is raised. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to speak very briefly in opposition to the good Senator's amendment. I understand his concern. And if I'm still serving in this chamber and if he is still serving in this chamber and if the constitutional amendment passes, I look forward to working with him and uh, very sincerely hearing uh, his thoughts, the thoughts of Republicans and Democrats uh, in, this, in this body in terms of what is the appropriate amount of time for early voting. But I would submit that it is, um, you know, the thing that I love most about my job in the state Senate is that we've got 49 other examples to look to. And Connecticut is not a leader here. We are very much a follower. Uh, with 40 other states across the country offering early voting, the vast majority of those states we see set their rules, regulations, and procedures for voting through statute. And it's because year to year, values may change, voters may change their minds. Uh, and as a result, the legislature, which I believe to be a, a true reflection of the people's will, I hope we all believe that regardless of our political beliefs, given the fact that we hold this job, the legislature has an opportunity to exercise the people's will and the flexibility to do so by changing slightly uh, into the future, the election procedures without going through this process, which I don't think I need to convince anybody on this committee is incredibly burdensome because here we are yet again, discussing these very same am amendments. I would urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment, if for no other reason than the fact that any change to the law, to the, the bill that was passed in 2019, the resolution, I should say, would undo that progress that was made. And I would 
humbly remind my colleagues that this very language passed through the House of Representatives and the, the Senate for that matter on a bipartisan basis, but it was so bipartisan in the House of Representatives that it passed by uh, 125 to four. In other words, undoing all of this progress in my mind is simply not worth it when we could very easily and I think ought to pursue the good senator's suggestions through a statutory change if the voters decide to approve this amendment. And just a, a few words, uh, Mr. Chair, about why I believe it's not um, nonsense to raise concerns about voter ID laws, specifically photo identification. According to the ACLU, Mr. Chair, less than 15% 15, uh, 15 of US citizens, uh, that's 21 million Americans, do not have a government issued photo identification. And my colleagues on the other side of the aisle might suggest that we could offer photo ID for free for everybody. And I think that sounds like a wonderful idea. The problem is in order to to verify that identification and in order to pursue that free identification, you might have to pay for underlying things like a birth certificate. And by the way, even if everything is free in the process, all of the, whether it's the birth certificate or the photo identification, there are other major burdens for people to get those IDs, whether it's folks with disabilities, the elderly, those in rural areas who might not have access to a car or to public transportation. Um, you know, what's really interesting to me, uh, Mr. Chair, is that we've we've heard a lot about nonpartisan studies. Here's one that that I think is instructive as we decide how to vote on this amendment. A 2014 GAO study couldn't be more nonpartisan. Uh, a federal study found that strict voter ID laws reduced turnout by two to three percentage points. That can translate into tens of thousands of votes in a given election. We've been spending a lot of time talking in this committee about how every vote matters. Well, this is a whole lot of votes, a whole lot of people who might be disenfranchised if we were to approve this amendment. So I would very respectfully urge my colleagues to vote no. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Master Francesca, your hand is raised. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, we are replacing a part of our, our constitution that clearly says we have a day specified of when we're going to vote. We are asking in this amendment to specify to replace that with another time frame. Nothing, nothing unreasonable to ask for. As far as far as photo ID goes, I think we beat this this subject before. Um, I, I, I have to tell you, you know, I'm going to take a, a word from Senator Slap from before. And he said that it's a partisan issue. Well, I got to tell you, and uh, referring to Senator Haskell, I constantly hear how, um, let me see how I word this, because I, I clearly don't want to offend anybody. But uh, let me just say this, and it's kind of uh, probably not off the topic, but I constantly hear you say that 48 or 49 other states are doing this and we are behind the times. I think you've said that a few times, and that's fine. I understand your concerns on that, but guess what? And you and you and you support that because a lot of other states are doing. You think we should be up on the times, but there's 45 other states out there that do not mandate vaccines. Okay, so you can't have it both ways. When it's to, to your benefit, it's okay to follow the other states, but when it's not. It, it's a different story. So I, I, I got to be honest with you. I get I get a little a little um, frustrated when I hear this conversation and making it look like that it's the Republican side uh, making it partisan on our side that we want to suppress voters. Asking somebody for a voter ID, uh, like Senator Sampson said, is not unreasonable. We can certainly make accommodations. And when I hear comments that we can't do this because of finances, how are people going to get it? Well. This state of Connecticut is, I would say, would give them an A++ for the amount of work they do to try to help people. We do that all the time. So it's not an unreasonable request. Um, so I would, um, I'm just going to end with that. Um, before, I, I don't want to get into a bit um, tit for tat with everybody on here, but I, I have to say that some of the comments I'm hearing are very uh, frustrating. Um, but I guess we can save those for another day. I would certainly encourage my colleagues, as long as they, as well as my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, to to support this amendment. And if you truly want to be bipartisan and help people and work with everybody, and if you cared about the election process 
you would certainly support this amendment or maybe would have supported the other one. Uh, that's all I have to say right now, um, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Flexer. Just really quick, um, Mr. Chair, just for a point of clarification for the running of the, the meeting, I just want both folks that are watching from home and the members of the committee to be reminded that our comments need to go through and to the chair. We are not to speak to each other. We are to speak to Chairman Fox during today's meeting and direct all of our comments through him. We do that. That is part of the way that the General Assembly, General Assembly uh, debates things both in committee and on the House and Senate floor. Uh, that is in an effort to maintain a level of decorum for the discussion where clearly we have a variety of strong opinions here, um, but it, all the comments need to go to and through the chair so that our conversation stays focused on the resolution or amendments or bills before us and it does not um, become a, a conversation between members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Haskell, your hand is raised. It is, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will be brief through you. I did just wanna uh, clarify a few uh, of, of my positions mentioned by my, my good colleague, uh, the ranking member. First of all, it is, I certainly would like to correct the record and say it is not my intent to impugn that the, that any legislator on this committee is trying to suppress votes. We all ran for office, whether we are capital D Democrats or capital R Republicans. I believe we are all believers that in a democracy, we're better off when more people participate. So I do not claim that it is any legislator's intent to suppress the votes. I only mean to say that it is the inevitable result of this amendment, should it pass into law, that it, I believe, would suppress the votes. And not because I, I'm sitting here thinking and worrying that that might be the case, but because we've seen it play out in so many other states across the country. And that brings me to my other point. Uh, the, the good tentative through you, Mr. Chair, is correct that sometimes I point to other states and say that they're doing the right thing, and sometimes I point to other states and doing the wrong thing. I think that's the beauty of serving in state government. It's why Justice Brandeis said we're laboratories of democracy. We find good examples to follow and bad examples to avoid. And uh, you know, it, it isn't 49 or 48 other states that have early voting, but it is 40. And if that number has changed, it's only because since this bill was debated in 2019, the state of New York actually brought early vote into their state. And I'll note they were able to do it over the course of a year because it only required a very efficient statutory change. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Representative Fishbein, your hand is raised. Yes, sir. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to bring us back to the actual amendment before us. Um, and I believe a portion of it has to do with uh, setting certain dates um, for this early voting. And, you know, a concern comes to my mind that without that, that a subsequent legislature that crafts whatever surrounding this concept um, without some sort of curtailing guide marks, fences, could permit early voting at any time, you know, and let's say back to August or so, you know, in the summertime, which we normally have primaries. And, you know, I guess my concern is that without those parameters, you know, we could reasonably believe that our town hall would be a central place for this, this early voting. But we also have the 75 foot rule. You know, one cannot have political materials or, you know, campaign within the 75 foot rule. So it begs the question, you know, myself being a lawyer, many times I'll go to my local town hall to do a title search or something like that. Would that bar me from entering my town hall with a shirt that has my name on it? Because potentially, there may be somebody who's early voting in August or September or October. It may not happen that particular day, but it could happen without these guideposts. And the other problem that we have without these guideposts is the uncertainty of the public when they eventually potentially vote on this question. 
how are they going to know? Are those guideposts in place? So I do support the amendment. I think those guideposts are a, uh, a reasonable way to deal with this in conjunction with the other portions of the amendment. And um, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. Thank you, Representative Fishbein. Representative Blumenthal, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I just want to speak briefly on the amendment through you. Uh, I have a comment. Um, you know, when it comes down to these amendments and when it comes down to this constitutional amendment, I think what we're really talking about is a matter of trust. And who we're asking whether we trust is the Connecticut voters. Do we trust Connecticut voters to decide whether we should have early voting. After all, this amendment is an effort to increase the restrictions uh, on, on that level of early voting that would happen in the constitution. And those levels of strictures are exactly why we got into this situation in the first place. Our constitution is tremendously hard to amend and it takes a long time and it prevents us from being responsive. It prevents us from putting questions before the public. Now, some of the my colleagues have have put forward some situations that could be potentially outrageous, a kind of parade of horribles of, you know, versions of early voting that I think we could all agree shouldn't be enacted. But the question is right now, do we trust that the voters of Connecticut, if we enact an absurd version of early voting are smart enough and dedicated enough not to return those people who vote for that absurd version to office. And I think we all have to say, yes, we do trust the people of Connecticut, the voters of Connecticut to do that. Otherwise, I don't know why we're here. And so I think when we're looking at our constitution, we need to make sure that it is providing our basic powers of our government and our basic rights of our government, because otherwise the people will not have an opportunity to have their voice heard through us, through electing us, through rejecting us. We should be providing for the basic power of this legislature to enact early voting as the people see fit through us. And we should be enacting the basic right through our constitution of the people to have early voted. And all other questions are most responsibly and responsibly addressed through the elections we have every two years where the people vote for us or don't based on what we've done. And I think early voting fits within that category uh, and should be discussed, you know, the individual strictures, the time period, the mechanism should be discussed in the legislature, the branch of the government that is most responsive to the people. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. I think for Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't mean to, to speak uh, for a second time, but I, I just feel like I wish I had taken a moment to speak for a second time before the last amendment that we ran just to respond to some of the, the, the commentary that occurred in between. Um, and a lot of other folks uh, in, uh, of, on this committee uh, in both parties have taken the chance to respond to one another's comments. So I'm gonna do the same uh, very briefly. Um, first thing, as far as what other states do, yeah, there's a lot of other states with early voting. I wanna point out that I am offering an amendment that allows for early voting because the, it was uh, assumed in, men, in much of the commentary by the majority that we're trying to stop early voting. We're, we're not, we're trying to clarify early voting to be a specified period of time. Um, I would also note that lots of other states also have photo identification as a requirement. So that's a, a common precedent that other legislatures across the country ha have determined for themselves. Um, I keep hearing that this is such an arduous process to change the constitution. And I'm so thankful for that because I can only imagine the changes that the legislature would have made over the years to our constitution, particularly when it comes to the first and second amendment. Um, and we're hearing uh, in the judiciary committee today, a bill that basically annihilates 
the uh, due process protections that are in our state and US constitutions. I don't want that to happen. Um, and just to finish up my comments, I wanna point out that I absolutely agree with Representative Blumenthal that this is about trust. But the question is asking the citizens of the state whether they trust our state government. And I think if you ask that question on a ballot, you might be um, not surprised to find out you get a pretty low number. So that's what this is about. Doing early voting effectively limits the power of the citizens because the constitutional amendment will take out of the constitution where they get to vote for changes and put it in the hands of the legislature. It does not maximize the citizens' power, it limits it. Um, and effectively, this amendment would also, but this amendment, I believe, does it in a way that is responsible by giving the voters a true depiction of what changes we want to make to our constitution instead of simply taking away from them their ability to know. Um, it's a true bipartisan effort on my part and my Republican colleagues to come to you as the majority and say, yes, okay, you, you have a majority, you wanna do early voting, let's do it responsibly, okay? Please don't characterize our position as fighting against early voting. We're here offering an early voting uh, bill that looks almost like the one that you folks put forward and passed by a majority in 2013 before it was voted down by the voters. I, I just, I, I wanna make it clear. This is a pro-early voting amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Any further comments or questions? Senator Flexer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I have a few questions for the proponent of the amendment. Please proceed, Representative Sampson, prepare yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, if this amendment were to pass and be a part of the resolution before this committee, would there then be two questions on the ballot? Senator Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And through you to uh, the uh, Senate chair, uh, thank you very much for the question. And just as an aside, thank you very, very much for the cooperative nature of our discussions on the subject of election uh, law. Um, I, I think that uh, you and I actually cooperate much more than anyone would, would expect, and uh, I hope that continues. Um, this uh, language that is here, I think it means that there would be one question on the ballot, but it would actually be two questions. Does that make sense? Uh, I Senator agree. Flexer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the good Senator's response. I guess then I would ask the question to um, our legislative commissioner's office. If, if, this, if this amendment were to pass, if this resolution would then have two questions on the ballot. Does LCO have a response? Uh, yeah, I, I think it actually would be similar to what happened um, at the 20. 18 election where there were two constitutional amendments on the ballot, um, both taken up with their own individual questions. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, I'd like to just follow that up with that question up with LCO. Um, and the reference that you made to the 2018 ballot, uh, Attorney Tellerico, is were there two separate resolutions that passed the General Assembly or just one that led to the two questions on the ballot? Attorney Hillary Co. Oh, uh, I, I was mistaken, I, I apologize. Those were two separate resolutions. It, it sounds like the amendment being offered now would um, displace, replace the, the present one. Okay, and I, I guess the point I'm trying to get at is is it customary that two questions would go on a ballot for a constitutional amendment for the people of Connecticut to consider in only one resolution? And I'm not asking your opinion. Again, just I know there are a lot of people watching this. So just for everyone's understanding, I'm just trying to see the president because it's my understanding in my time in the legislature that when the General Assembly has contemplated an amendment to the constitution and posed two questions to the people of Connecticut that they have been separate resolutions. That, oh, apologies, Mr. Chair, uh, that, that is correct. Um, 
each resolution would have its own question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, I see uh, if it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, it looks like the good Senator would like to respond to my line of questioning as well. So I am trying to um, you know, understand his amendment fully. So if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair, I would be happy to hear what it looks like Senator Sampson would like to add. Senator Sampson, do you have a response? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, to your co-chair, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to just say a couple words about this. First and foremost, I apologize. Uh, we put these amendments together moments before the committee meeting. We didn't get to flesh out how they are worded as, um, as well as I would have liked. Um, I would certainly be open to uh, modifying this amendment anyway uh, that might be amenable to uh, the co-chairs. Um, we could turn this into one question simply by saying, shall the constitution be amended uh, to allow the General Assembly to provide up to three days of early voting in person during the five days prior to the day of election and require the presentation of current and valid photo identification for the exercise of electoral privileges. And we could also, and I would be amenable to making it two separate questions and two separate constitutional amendments. But I, again, I certainly would like uh, any cooperation I could get and I'm willing to work with you whichever way you want. Senator Flexer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to the good Senator for, for that response. Um, I, I would unfortunately have to urge my colleagues um, to reject this amendment as we've debated quite a bit here this afternoon. Um, and I, I just wanna point out that um, I understand the efforts by all of my colleagues uh, on this committee to try to reinforce everyone's faith in the election and, and everyone in Connecticut's ability to participate in our election uh, process. And, and, I, and I think there is a genuine desire to do that across the spectrum of political beliefs that exist on this committee. Um, but unfortunately, this amendment, I think for a variety of reasons um, should be uh, rejected. Uh, I would say to the proponents of the amendment that I, again, similar to the last resolution uh, that this committee voted on earlier today, that I, I think that the members of this committee now and moving forward will be willing to have uh, broad conversations with regard to how these things are actually implemented. Um, but I do think, as some of my Democratic colleagues have pointed out here this afternoon, that the momentum for this um, this resolution that's before us is is too strong to now uh, go backwards and and accept the amendment today and and change the resolution and have to restart the the process, the very deliberate process for changing our state's constitution. And I have to highlight that you know, part of the amendment that the good Senator has put forward here today was considered by this uh, General Assembly and House Joint Resolution 95 during the 2017 um, legislative session. Uh, Chairman Fox and I have had the great honor and distinction of chairing this committee for several years now, uh, including in 2017. And we did try to broker a compromise um, and I'm proud that that um, in how, in 2017, uh, a resolution concerning early voting that had very similar requirements with regard to the days, uh, the maximum of five days of early voting and um, the minimum of two or three days of early voting um, in that resolution in, in 2017 and House Joint Resolution 95 is very similar to the amendment that we are currently debating in this committee that resolution did get bipartisan support. Um, many of the members uh, of this committee were a part of that vote in the House of uh, Representatives. Some members of this committee voted against that. Some members voted for it. It did receive a bipartisan vote, but that effort for compromise didn't work. Um, it didn't get enough support um, to meet the thresholds to be on the ballot in the House of Representatives and I'll cast blame on both sides. It never came up for a vote in the state Senate that year. And that um, was a decision made by Democrats and Republicans. Um, so I just wanna point this out because I think there has been an effort to try to find consensus on this particular issue with regard to a time frame um, in the past. And that didn't get the people of Connecticut what they've clearly been asking us for 
um, for a long time. We saw that that demonstrated in the hearing on this resolution uh, several weeks ago. And while I appreciate uh, the efforts of all members of this committee to contribute to the dialogue, um, I think we've been down this road before and I would reject, I would urge my colleagues to reject the amendment before us and move forward on the resolution as is. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Flexer. Seeing no further comments or questions, will the clerk please call the roll on proposed amendment uh, House Joint 59, I'll identify that Senator Sampson number four. House Joint Resolution 59, Sampson Amendment number four. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes no. Fox. Representative Fox votes no. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes no. Thomas. Rep Thomas votes no. Did you get it? Yes, thank you. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes yes on the amendment. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes yes. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes no on the amendment. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no on the amendment. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France. Representative France votes no on the amendment. Head that. Representative Haddad? Representative Haddad votes no on the amendment. Labriola. Representative Labriola votes yes. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vehi votes no on the amendment. McCrory. Senator McCrory votes no. Senator, I need your camera to be on, please. Okay. Is that better? Senator McCrory votes no. Thank you. Morin Bello. Representative Morin Bello votes no. Tom. Rep. Tom votes no. Rosario. Yeah. Representative Rosario votes no on the amendment. Santiago. Representative votes no on the amendment. Slap. Senator Slap votes no on the amendment. Representative Fishbein. Will the clerk please announce the tally? Three yay, 15 nay, one absent. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, the amendment has been rejected. We're back to House General Resolution 59. Any further comments or questions on the underlying resolution? Mr. Senator, Chairman, I believe I still have the floor. You do, please proceed, sir. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, without uh, beating a dead horse, uh, I will uh, I will say that um, I'm not surprised by the turnout of the vote. I hope that the uh, confusion over the uh, the question uh, on the ballot was not a determining factor, but I don't, I don't believe so. Um, you'll see that uh, it makes a lot more sense in this next amendment that I'm going to offer, which um, if you want to get that process started, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Clerk, it is Senate, um, I'm sorry, it's HJR 59 Sampson Amendment 3. I sent that one earlier before I sent number 
Yes. I'm going to let the three of them if everybody has it. Maybe we'll give, give a minute or two for people to get situated center if we can. Just make sure everyone has it in, 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 in front of them. I believe, uh, having heard no objection to the people who don't have in front of them, uh, the, we are now, um, Senator Sampson, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. This is a similar amendment to the previous one. Um, basically, this amendment takes out the uh, time frame entirely and uh, leaves the, uh, the, the uh, constitutional amendment intact with regard to allowing for early voting uh, without limitations. Uh, but it does require um, photo identification uh, to vote and it does generate two ballot questions. Uh, the first of which would be, shall the constitution of the state be amended to permit the General Assembly to provide for early voting? The same basic question that we have uh, considered. And the second question, shall the constitution of the state be amended to require the presentation of current and valid photo ID for the extra exercise of electoral privileges? I am offering this amendment um, in case there were any objections to the limiting uh, day and time frame uh, with the hope that um, we could agree that um, photo ID is not an obtrusive um, requirement uh, for voting. Uh, I would point out in response to um, Senator Haskell's comments earlier that um, I'm not aware of any reduction in turnout in states that have uh, a photo ID requirement, but if it does in fact reduce the turnout by two to 3%, um, I would say there might be many reasons for that. And um, the fact that uh, it's preventing people from voting unlawfully might be a good one. Um, although we will never know. Um, but the fact that we could put a requirement in place that is very easy to achieve since the vast majority of people already have a photo ID and to adopt a policy to put uh, one in the hands of every eligible voter in the state is an easy task and something we are all committed to doing if necessary, um, I believe it would do a lot to restore the faith in the electorate in our elections. And I move adoption of the amendment and I'd ask for a roll call once again, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Senator Sampson. A motion has been made for the adoption. The amendment by the Senator uh, for a vote to be taken, we take a roll call at will. Uh, Senator, I may just proceed with just two, I think two brief questions. Um, again, uh, procedurally wise, this, this amendment is to the underlying resolution at hand. This would, and if I'm correct, if I'm correct this will reset the, the, the process by which the three fourths or majority or the process by which this goes to the chamber. Is that correct? Mm, that, that, is, that is correct, Mr. Chairman. But as I said before, our process allows for a one time uh, passage by a three quarters majority or two consecutive legislatures by a mere majority. And uh, it would be my sincere hope that if we could get this amendment passed, um, that we could achieve it uh, in this one session with a three quarters majority and thus keep us on the same time frame uh, that uh, is likely to occur with the underlying uh, resolution. Thank you, Senator. And the um... The section with the photo IDs, that's included within lines eight to 10, is that correct of the amendment? That is correct. That is the substantive change requiring a valid photo ID for um, uh, presentation at the time of exercising voting privileges. And would this, uh, thank you, Senator. Another quick follow-up question. Um, by the way this is written, would this, I'm just, I first time I looked at it, so I apologize for being my my question might be sound kind of silly. But would this require a photo ID for someone to vote by absentee ballot as written? Do you know? I do not believe so. But I could be corrected, and so could the amendment. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Um, any further questions or comments from members of the committee? 
Senator Haskell, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A very brief question to the proponent of the amendment, respectfully and through you. Uh, is there any other state that, that the good senator is aware of that re includes a photo ID requirement in their state constitution? I recognize other states do have photo ID requirements, but is it, is it a constitutional requirement in any other state? Senator I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And through you to Senator Haskell, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I apologize. Um, I did come up with a list of what all the requirements are state by state, but that is not something I uh, analyzed and broke out. Um, I, I would say that it's, it's more likely than not, though, because I noticed in my perusal of the state by state comparison, the vast majority of states do put these parameters in their constitution. Um, that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, Senator Haskell. I thank the good senator for his answer, and I, I certainly understand uh, his answer. Just, and, and we won't feed a dead horse here, but I do just want to once again urge my colleagues to oppose the amendment, specifically citing a, a study from the University of California in 2016 that confirmed voter identification laws suppress votes, and not just any votes, they suppress the votes of those who are most vulnerable and don't have access to IDs. There was also, of course, a 2014 study that found that voter ID laws in Kansas and Tennessee dropped voter turnout by over 1,000, uh, 100,000 votes. I, I apologize, 100,000 votes. And finally, just one more nuance to add to the conversation. We, we often talk, maybe not necessarily in this committee, but broadly in the General Assembly about the importance of fiscal responsibility. These laws cost money, right? Texas spent $2 million on voter education and outreach efforts following the passage of their voter ID law. The state of Indiana decided that they would provide free ID cards, which is something I personally would fight for if this amendment were to pass and to become law. But doing so just between, in the three years between 2007 when they passed that statute and 2010, they spent $10 million on that effort. So I don't think it's a good idea from a matter purely of public policy in terms of making our democracy as inclusive and accessible as possible while maintaining the integrity of our elections. But I also don't think that it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. So I'll be voting no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Haskell. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? We're voting on uh, special resolution for that. Senator Sampson Amendment number three. House Drink Resolution 59, Sampson Amendment number three. Flex, sir. Senator Flexer votes no on the amendment. Fox. Representative Fox votes no on the amendment. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes no. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes no on the amendment. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes yes on the amendment. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes yes. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes no on the amendment. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes on the amendment. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes yes on the amendment. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes no on the amendment. Labriola. Representative Labriola votes yes. McCarthy Vahey. Representative McCarthy Vahey votes no. McCrory. Senator McCrory. Sen Senator McCrory votes no on the amendment. Morin Bello. Representative Morin Bello votes no. Pong. Rep Pong votes no. Rosario. 
Representative Rosario votes no on the amendment. Santiago. Representative Santiago wrote, votes no on the on the amendment. Slap. Senator Slap votes no on the amendment. Representative Fishbein. Madam Clerk, when you're ready, please note the roll. I'm just tally. Five yay, 13 nay, one absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The amendment fails. Uh, Senator Sanson, I believe the floor is still yours. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, not unexpected, but uh, I, I will reiterate my disappointment that we can't come to an agreement on, on photo ID. Um, you know, the, the, the point was made that, uh, you know, it, applying an ID requirement might um, restrict access for some folks. Um, and, and maybe that's true, but I mean, we apply photo IDs in lots of cases. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, driving, you know, buying a car, opening a checking account, cashing a check. Um, there's a reason why we do that. And that's to make sure that we have the right person. And, um, it concerns me that we are less concerned about having the right person for voting than we are for so many other things, including buying uh, cigarettes. You know, I, it just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and you know, I, I, we also, you need a driver's license to be able to, to get a, a, or photo ID to get a pistol permit or to, to buy a firearm or to, to carry one and, and things like that. Um, and I, I would argue those, those are uh, constitutional concerns that would limit people also from a constitutional right, um, but I don't think they're necessarily bad ideas. So I just thrown it out there for food for thought in the future. You all get the chance to vote on these amendments again in the House and Senate, no doubt. So I will continue to try and make the case. Uh, it is offered in no other reason than I believe it is not a uh, significant intrusion into the lives of people, but would give me and plenty of other folks much more confidence that we have the right people voting. And by right people, I mean true eligible voters, um, you know, not people that um, are ineligible or up to something nefarious. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to uh, not offer the final amendment that I was going to to the committee, but I do want to talk about it for a second. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the bill in front of me, maybe I can do it. This bill is not substitute language. Is that true, Mr. Chairman? Uh, the current resolution before us. The current yep. resolution, was this the one that was JFS or no? Uh, this is this is the language that was before the General Assembly two years ago. Oh yeah, that's right. We couldn't change it. Thank you very much, yep. Mr. Chairman. Okay, so this, this is the, the proper language. Um, I just want to address the question um, the question that is contained in this resolution reads, shall the constitution of the state be amended to permit the General Assembly to provide for early voting? Um, I was willing to leave that intact in the other amendments, uh, but I do not believe that that is an appropriate uh, question to be asking the voters, because as I mentioned on the previous resolution, I, I don't think it's being honest with the voters. Um, we're asking them much more than that. We are asking them to place their trust in the hands of the state government to determine what early voting is and what the parameters are, and for us to take their right to determine that out of the Constitution. Since the Constitution already specifies the parameters, which is one day, uh, and the alternative of absentee voting by certain excuses, uh, we are effectively taking away the people's right to determine what those parameters are when we say, um, that the state government is now going to set those parameters. But that is not in the question. The question just says, um, will you allow for early voting? Not will you give up your constitutional protections and will you trust your state government? So I would just contemplate um, that there ought to be a change to this question to be more specific. Um, 
and I was going to offer an amendment, which I will not do today, but there is a possibility I will continue to work on this um, purely um, to try and come up with the best and most accurate question I can. It's not intended to derail anything. I believe the voters um, should be able to get to make the choice, whatever it is. But I think they have to make an informed choice. Um, and we talk about that on lots of issues across the legislature. And um, simply asking them if they like early voting is akin to asking them if they want free money, in my opinion. And it's not an informed choice. I had contemplated a question that says, shall the constitution of the state be amended to remove the one day limitation on in-person voting and to allow the general assembly to provide for opportunities of early voting without any limitations? Um, that's a more truthful question to be asking people. And you're right if you're thinking that more, less people would be le inclined to vote yes, but that's not what we should be worried about. What we should worry, be worried about is whether or not the people are actually being told the truth when they make their choice. And I will just leave you folks with that and suggest that um, we will have another opportunity uh, in the House and Senate to work together with uh, our uh, leadership, um, the committee chairs, and um, hopefully with uh, the entire body of legislators to hopefully come up with some uh, alternatives. Uh, I understand there's no requirement on behalf of the majority to do that because of the makeup and the likelihood of the passage of the um, uh, early voting amendment by a simple majority. But I would like to work together to do something that is uh, truly bipartisan, that takes into consideration uh, the voters that I represent uh, and the rest of my Republican colleagues, since we do make up a significant portion of the state. And I know from my personal experience that the people I represent want to see photo ID and they do want to see um, checks and balances uh, employed in our voting laws. And with that, uh, Madam Chairman, I'm going to uh, indicate that I'm going to vote no on the current early voting uh, bill, uh, not because I'm against early voting, but because I want to work with you to come up with a better compromise, hopefully when it gets to the Senate. Thank you, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Senator Sampson. I appreciate your comments and look forward to working with you uh, together. Any further comments or questions on the underlying resolution before the committee has term resolution number 59? Representative Master Francesca, your hand is raised. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I can't see you on my screen here. I, oh, there you are. So I apologize. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think it was a, a good debate today. I um, have to obviously agree with Senator Sampson this is, um, it's not, I'm, I'm not against early voting at all. Uh, I think it's good. Um, if we can make it the process easier for people. I think it's great, but I do have an issues with the, the process and the, the timing that there's no time framing. So um, based on that, I would be voting no today, but I do support early voting. And I hope that at some point this can be worked out so we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate your comments as well. Look forward to working with you as well. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on House Joint Resolution Number 59, LCO 3599. House Joint Resolution 59, Jack to floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes yes. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. Did you see me, Madam Clerk? There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes yes on the resolution. Haddad. 
Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola votes no. McCarthy Vahey. Representative McCarthy Vahey votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory votes yes. Morin Bello. Representative Morin Bello votes yes. One more time, Representative, please. Sure. Representative Morin Bello votes yes. Thank you. Palm. Representative Palm votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Representative Santiago vote, votes yes on the resolution. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. Representative Fishbein. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I think we may have the ranking members like uh, may keep the votes open a half an hour for the conclusion of the meeting. Would that work? Say one of the some one of the members has not yet voted. Does that, that work for them? Um, I'm yes. I'm sorry. What time were you going to leave the votes open until um, half an hour at that to the conclusion of the meeting? Can we leave them open until six? Uh, assuming we're done by six, yes. I mean, half an hour after the, the after the conclusion of the meeting. So okay. So if I if we end at four thirty, they'll be open till five. That's Is correct. That yeah. So yeah, I need yeah. to keep talking until 530. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. <laughs> Thank you. All set, Mr. Chair, would you like a tally or since we're leaving the votes open, you're muted. I uh, know we're going to keep the votes open till six o'clock. Does that work? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm all, all right. set. Thank you. Votes to be held open at six o'clock. Moving on to the next item agenda. Uh, section three under number three, Senate Bill number 901. An act of Senate June 30, 2021, changes implemented for the 2020 state election as a result of COVID-19. Is there a motion? So moved. The second. Seconded. Seconded. Made by Senator Fletcher, seconded by Representative McCarthy Vahey. Uh, the underlying bill extends to June 2020, it's to June 30th, 2021. The absentee voting and election re return change is implemented for the 2020 election as a result of COVID 19. For any state or municipal election, primary or referendum occurring before July 1, 2021, the bill generally makes changes. A lot of it, a lot of, much of it is the bill that we passed this past summer, the special session bill, just in the ABs, but it'll, it'll, it'll kick those uh, changes for the AB process out till June 30th, 2021. There are a number of towns, primarily small towns throughout the state of Connecticut that have referendums that have elections in May and June. Uh, some special elections coming up as a result of some vacancies, which will be affected by these, which could potentially be implemented by these changes. Any questions or comments? Representative Master from Chester, your hand is raised. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I won't be too long on this particular uh, bill. Okay, um, three years, Mr. Chairman, can you tell me what towns are affected by this by this date? I knew that was going to be the first question. I, I don't have the answer right now. I'm not. I, Senator Fletcher, are you aware of any towns? I'm sorry. Can the good representative repeat her question one more time? Because I think I can name many of them. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, through okay. Mr. Chair. The um, towns that are affected by this particular deadline in this bill. Senator Fletcher. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, there are a number of municipalities um, that hold their municipal elections on a Monday in May of this year. Um, they include communities like Bethany and Woodbridge, I believe boroughs like Litchfield and Danielson. Um, they elect their legislative bodies and their um, the towns um, like Andover, Union, Bethany, Woodbridge, um, they elect all of their municipal offices on that day in May. 
and there are others. That's not a comprehensive list. I can certainly get that while that conversation continues for the good representative, but that's an example of some of the communities that are affected. Thank you. Um, and thank you. And through you, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I was just confused because this particular bill, and this one is 901, Senate Bill 901 and House Bill 6464, which is the next item, have basically do the same thing, but they're two separate. So I was confused of why do we have two bills? One is much shorter than the other one. This one's probably, I don't know, I got a lot of pages here. <laughs> So, but they both effectively do the same thing. And through you, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Flexer, you had mentioned these towns here were, primaries were in May. This particular bill that we're talking about would extend it through June 30th. The House bill extended through May. So wouldn't this particular bill take care of everything? Why do we have two, I guess? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Senator, if I can just make one quick comment in response to Representative Smith's inquiry. I will say, in terms of the, and I, I don't mean to speak on a bill that's on before us, but this bill is about 30 pages long. The next bill is about seven pages long. And my understanding is that this bill is the line, that length because the next bill yeah, does not necessarily include as much language with the pre processing reps of ABs, because the idea being that they're, ideally there'll be, there'll be less ABs, not, but realistically there'll be less, less ABs used in the smaller town elections. So it, it takes out a lot of language that addresses the pre-processing of ABs, which is included in the, which is in, included in the one in the bill before us. Does that make sense? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So if both of these had passed and we voted on them, which one would be for each for the town? Would it, wouldn't ultimately the second bill overtake the first one? Is <laughs> Who's on first, right? So, so I, I understand, Mr. Chairman, that you mentioned that it's, some of these items are not um, wouldn't affect certain towns, right? Because they may not. There's not a big turnout, but wouldn't they able be able to use those services as well? Because we passed both. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Chairman? Uh, it does. And I think the, the, the bill would affect each town. But the bills, but the bill before us is a little broader in terms of the the application of the bill. Because it, it provides for all the, the pre-processing of ABs, the language that pertains to pre-processing ABs that we did last summer, and so it, I, both bills would affect each every town, but they're just one one is more narrow in scope. Okay, thank you. So through, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, if both of these bills pass, towns could dismiss the House Bill six four six four and follow the guidelines for Senate Bill nine hundred one. Would that be correct, for Mr. Chair? I think representative that if one bill passes, the other one may not may not need to be called. Uh, that's my that, that that'd be my my guess. There, there's there's a bill one bill in each chamber, each more or less doing the same thing. And so I think it's just a matter of which bill is called by what chamber. And I know it's somewhat time sensitive, but some of these elections are coming, and the AB processes are going to begin relatively soon. So, uh, thank you for for clarifying that. Um, and through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when we voted on this back in, I believe it was July, I thought it was very important that people feel safe and secure when they go out to vote. And I think we've accomplished that. And I was more than happy to support it back then. Um, but then we came back again and voted for, for the general election. I was happy to hear the Secretary of State say that there were no uh, reports of anybody coming in contact with COVID-19 due to going out to vote in the November election. So I was very, very, very pleased to hear that, that it wasn't an issue. I, I think back then we were in a much different time than we are today. We have our vaccine out. Uh, many people are opting to get that as well. The, what concerned me about this bill the, the second time is I'm confused on a piece of the language that's in here and maybe perhaps you can clarify it for me through you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. What does the sickness of COVID-19 mean? Who is that for? Is my question. Whose sickness, I guess. Whose sickness of COVID-19 is what I'm trying to understand. Are we identifying a certain line in the bill? Oh, I'm looking at the, uh, I'm sorry, the section 9-135 of the statute that it refers to. It refers to the sickness of COVID-19. Why 
Let me see if I can find the line for you. I apologize. Line, line, line 20. I'm sorry, say that again for you, Mr. Line, line 20. Line 20. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So through you, Mr. Chairman, I guess I just wanted to find out whose sickness are we talking about? Um, give me one second. The line, line, line 20 reads sickness of COVID-19. If I recall uh, from the drafting of the legislation that this would be would we would we allow for actually ballots only if you are sick or some we can just reread the section line language out of St. Louis. I guess Representative, you're asking is it is it for uh, an individual sickness or is it is it for the fear of sickness? Is it for the individual sickness? That's that, that, that you're asking is it is it geared towards is it geared towards the individual or is it geared towards the the town or the community? No, no, well, I'm just reading the, the, the language. Um, it, is it, who is it referring to COVID-19 sickness? Is it for the individual that is voting? Because everything else, and that's, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, thank you. In, in the statutes, 9-135, everything is referred to as such electors, your. Um, and also in this, um, starting on lines six and on, it's talking about you such elector. So I'm trying to figure out what COVID-19 sickness is. Who is that for? Who does that qualify for? It's it's geared towards the individual voter. The idea that there's a uh, highly contagious, perhaps fatal disease with a, have a pandemic level in their community. So it's not, it's not their sickness. You're saying that it's not their individual sickness that would give them the opportunity to vote COVID-19? Vote by absentee due to COVID-19 sickness? It's not, we're not talking about their sickness or their illness. Uh, we could be. It could be. <laughs> I mean, if an individual has COVID-19, they get an absentee ballot per, per this language. If an individual is fearful of the pandemic level, highly contagious, fatal disease that's out there, they can also get an absentee ballot per certain of this language. So it's not necessarily through you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so it's not necessarily their sickness because it says COVID-19 sickness. Uh, that, that's correct. And it further identifies what that sickness is in lines 20 to 23. I'm sorry, three, Mr. Say that again. It then further identifies what that sickness is in lines 20, 20, 20 23. Yes. Yeah. So, so I see that it identifies what it is, but what I want to know is who is this, who, who is it for? Who is, it's for the sickness for, is it for your sickness, your neighbor's sickness? Who? Because clearly in 9-135, it refers to such elector persons active in the service, such elector person's physical disability or such elector or person's illness. So are we in here, three of Mr. Chairman, just saying that COVID-19 is a sickness or an illness? Um, I guess I'm somewhat, I don't mean to believe the point, I'm a little confused by the question. Are we asking, are we, are we stating whether or not COVID-19 is a sickness or illness? We're stating COVID-19 is a reason one can get an FC ballot. And then the, the COVID-19, yeah. they get an FC ballot if, if they are sick with COVID-19 or, or if they are fearful of the pandemic, uh, fatal disease, highly contagious disease that's out there. So, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so I guess let, let me ask you the question. Is the purpose put in here because they are fearful of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, is that, that what it refers to? There you go. Uh, that, that could be a reason, yes. Sorry, I, I couldn't. Can you say that again? That that could be a reason. That could be a reason. Okay, it, because it, I, the reason why I asked you, it doesn't say it in here. Mm -hmm. It's it's um. It's I gotta be honest with you. In my mind, this is what have I have concerns about. I was happy to support it the first time, but the second time around, and this time I'm concerned because it it doesn't clarify when the secretary of state state states sent out her applications. 
It just said on there, COVID, all voters are able to check the box pursuant to Public Act 20-3. So when you go back and when you look at that, it's very misleading and it's it's not clear to the voters whether it is for their sickness or is it a fear of sickness? So I those think, are my concerns, but you're confirming to me that it could be the fear of sickness. Is that correct? This is the exact same line with those in our legislation. Well, I, I understand. <laughs> I understand that. I'm just trying to get confirmation. Is it for their illness or is it for their illness or their fear that they're in the community, they're out voting and they don't want to get COVID-19? Our Senate representative is that it's, it's, it's for all of the above. Okay, okay, that's what I wanted clarification on. Um, I think that's all the questions I had on that. Um, again, I, I didn't support this when it, they, we extended it back in August for the general election because I had concerns with that language. And you know, when people fill out an application for an absentee ballot, they have to be very clear and they have to sign off that the information that they are signing is um, accurate. And it's very confusing to the voter whether or not they are going to be using COVID-19 as a sickness, because if they are clearly, we don't need to have that because it's already in there. You can use, you can vote by absentee ballot if you are sick. So clearly we didn't need that. Um, so the language is not very clear to me. It wasn't the second time around. And this is, that's why I didn't support it then and um, certainly can't support it this time until the language is um, clarified for the voter. I think that's very important. Um, I do not have any other questions. Thank you so much for uh, answering my questions. Thanks. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Sampson, your hand is raised. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to follow up on uh, Representative Master Francesco's um, a line of questioning about the um, underlying bill, which we're extending uh, into the future, um, I had quite the conversation with the Secretary of State on this um, uh, incident, uh, for lack of a better term, and it's it's an interesting thing to dive into at the moment because you know we've had this conversation all day about uh, whether there's voter fraud or what the prevalence of it is and that kind of thing, and um, I sincerely tried my best to not make that a partisan issue today. Um, I don't know if that was clear or not by the reaction of some of my colleagues, I wonder. Um, the fact is that there is some elements of fraud. We heard that during the public hearing. Um, and one thing that had struck me over and over again was the number of people who said that the previous election, our November 2020 election was no excuse absentee voting which of course um, cannot possibly be the case because then otherwise we wouldn't be here today offering a constitutional amendment for no excuse absentee voting. So it begs many, many questions. Um, I also uh, heard people mentioned uh, that they, um, and I'm using this word more technically, but abuse the current exceptions for absentee voting regularly. Um, there's an argument that that's fraud, by the way. Um, I'm not suggesting that I would want to lock up people or find them $10,000 because they were actually in town on the day that they said they were not. But to imply that that's not um, absentee fraud is incorrect by the letter of the law. And the letter of the law is something that should matter to all of us. And um, this particular instance is a perfect example of an abuse of the letter of the law. And I have said from the very beginning that what the Secretary of State did by sending out absentee ballot applications to every registered voter on the voting rolls, um, including a statement saying that they can check the box for COVID-19 and indicating every voter can check that box, um, is an if itself fraud, because not every person was eligible to check that box, either by the statute that was passed during the special session that I think all of us voted for, um, and not by her memorandum uh, that she issued prior to that. 
Um, the fact of the matter is if we wanted to make it so every person could have voted by absentee ballot in the last election, you have only two choices. One of them is you've got to pass a constitutional amendment, which requires putting it on a ballot, or you have to um, change the definition in the list of exceptions to include the pandemic or fear of COVID or something of that effect. Um, but because everyone knew that couldn't happen because we couldn't send out a constitutional question and put it on a ballot because the whole point was the election, um, we ended up having a bill that didn't clearly define what we were talking about. And many people voted for that legislation um, completely misunderstanding what they were voting for. So I don't wanna beat a dead horse, but it should be on the record that um, since we are here and we are about to vote on extending what is a uh, very poorly written statute that was misunderstood at the very least by the Secretary of State and the public, that we ought to set that record straight. So just for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, did the Secretary of State have the constitutional or even statutory authority to broaden her interpretation of uh, the constitutional requirements for illness when she said that other people beyond people who are actually sick could be included? So thank you for the question. I think we're getting a little, um, is the question pertaining to the underlying statute, the underlying piece of legislation, I think we're getting a little, a little outside the scope of the present legislation before us. Mr. Chairman, I beg to differ. I mean, the fact is this bill is nothing more than an extension of the existing law. So the existing law is relevant. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it is completely relevant and germane. And I somewhat disagree. You're asking if the Secretary of State had the authority to... She redefined the constitution, Mr. Chairman. I wanna know under what statutory or constitutional authority she had to do that. And if you, if you can say that she didn't, or you can even say you don't know, but I, I, would, I would love an answer if you have one. I think what I can say, and I haven't read the case in a while or a long time actually, is that the Supreme Court ruled that she did have the authority. The Supreme Court did issue an opinion, mm -hmm. but um, I don't believe it speaks to the Secretary of State's authority. They simply referred to um, Executive Order 7QQ, which I want to just remind everyone, Executive Order 7QQ, which is the basis of the legislation before us um, and where it all began, was done during the middle of the summer before the primary. And it contains language, in fact, that says um, that it is limited by um, whether or not there is a widely available vaccine. Um, I know that's not relevant since we passed a law that doesn't say that, but I just thought I'd point it out that that was the opinion back in the day when the governor was, uh, <laughs> was doing this. Um, the Secretary of State issued a memorandum and in her mem memorandum, which I, I disagree with, she said, um, and this is a quote from her own memorandum, that individuals who may have been in contact with COVID-19 infected individuals, such as healthcare workers, first responders, individuals who are caring for someone, um, as well as those that feel ill or think they are ill because of the possibility of contact with COVID-19, should be included in the category of voters that would qualify as ill for the purpose of absentee voting. So even by that definition, that doesn't mean anyone can check the box because not everyone fits into that category. And I believe that when she issued that memorandum, she was saying something that is in direct uh, contradiction to the constitution. And you know, for the sake of this meeting and the fact that no one wants to hear this, uh, you know, I'm gonna move on, but it should not be lost on us that by voting today to extend those uh, this legislation, 
uh, into the future, we are endorsing what is um, completely misunderstood. I, you know, when we had the uh, public hearing, almost every person that I heard testify in favor of the no excuse absentee voting implied or stated outright that they felt we just had a no excuse absentee voting election, which we did not, at least not by law or by our constitution. And um, if that was the understanding of the public, it was incorrect because the only way that could have happened is with a constitutional amendment. Um, but what I believe happened is a combination of things. Um, rather than putting fear of COVID into the statute, uh, because they knew it was not constitutional, they just said because of COVID, which is kind of a bizarre uh, way to do things so that people don't question it too much because people then assumed all what they wanted to assume. Some people said, well, it's people who have COVID. Oh, oh well, it's, pe it's because we have a pandemic or because it's because of fear of COVID. But those are all separate uh, examples and separate questions. And some would be constitutional um, changes by statute and some would not. And when the secretary of state went the extra step, which is what I found offensive um, to send out the ballots, and to indicate every person could check off the box. I believe she was committing a crime. I got no issue saying it, by the way, and people can challenge me all they want, but I would love to have this debate in a court of law about what is truly constitutional. All I'm suggesting is that before you vote today, um, I believe it's incumbent upon the chairs of this committee, and I don't mean to put them on the spot, but to indicate to people truly what that means, uh, COVID-19 in that statute. Does it mean just people who are sick or um, people as defined in the Secretary of State's memorandum, which is people who are in contact with people who may have been sick? Or does it mean fear of COVID as she implied when she sent out those um, absentee ballot applications? Um, we should have that on the record so that the public knows. But I will also state that that does open the situation up to another constitutional challenge because I believe that if it's implied, once again, that anyone can check the box and anyone can get it, that's not constitutional. I will just close by saying that had the legislature offered a constitutional amendment for fear of COVID, I would have gladly voted for it. So my issue is not over whether or not I agree with whether people should be allowed to vote based on fear of COVID, but we have a constitutional process, which we've talked about at length today and about the reasons why it is difficult to change um, and why that's a good thing. Um, and that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your time and pardon my uh, lengthy diatribe. Thank you, Senator. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on House. Hang on. On JF motion to the floor of House Bill 901. Senate Bill 901, JF to the floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Mastro Francesco. Representative Mastro Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes yes. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes no. I'm so sorry, Representative. I'm not sure why it always happens. Um, one more time, please. Perhaps it's because one of the quieter members today, Representative Carpino votes no. Thank you. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes no on the bill. Haddad. 
Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola votes no. McCarthy Beatty. Representative McCarthy Beatty votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory. Moran Bello. Representative Moran Bello votes yes. Palm. Representative Palm votes yes. Rosario. Representative Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Representative Santiago votes yes. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. Representative Fishbein. Senator McCrory. All set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Madam Clerk, votes to be held open until 6 o'clock tonight. Moving on, uh, six, subsection three, item number four, House Bill number 6464, an act extending to May 31st, 2021, several changes implemented for the 2020 state election as a result of COVID-19. Motion of JF to the floor, is there a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. There a second. Motion made by Senator Fletcher, second by Representative McCarthy Vahey. Any questions or comments? Representative Master Francesco, your hand is raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really don't have any um, questions on this. Is is uh, very similar to the bill that we just voted on. Just to say that, again, my concerns where are the intent of the language? It's not clear to the voter, and that is a very much a concern of mine. When they sign off on those applications or ballots, they are putting their signature down under penalty of perjury that they that that is correct, and it's very unclear as what's the intent of that language is. So um, I'll be voting no. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any further comments or questions? Senator Flexer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say briefly that I think um, the conversation around this legislation and the legislation that this committee just voted on is important and I'll just leave it at that. And I just wanna say that I do think concerns around COVID persist. Um, now and in the next couple of months, we're seeing the vaccines roll out, but not everyone's going to be able to avail themselves of it, especially during the time period that's contemplated in the bill before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Flex. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the rule on raised bill 6464 motion, Jeff motion to the floor. House Bill 6464, Jeff to the floor. Flexer. Senator Flexer votes yes. Fox. Representative Fox votes yes. Haskell. Senator Haskell votes yes. Thomas. Representative Thomas votes yes. Sampson. Senator Sampson votes no. Master Francesco. Representative Master Francesco votes no. Blumenthal. Representative Blumenthal votes yes. Carpino. Representative Carpino votes yes. Can you see me, ma'am? <laughs> no, I can't. Thank, Thank you. you. Fishbein. Representative Fishbein. France. Representative France votes yes. Haddad. Representative Haddad votes yes. Labriola. Representative Labriola votes no. McCarthy Vehi. Representative McCarthy Vahey votes yes. McCrory. Senator McCrory. Sen Sen Senator McCrory votes yes. Senator, I need your camera on, please. Yeah, I'm trying to get there. 
One second. No problem. Uh, yeah, there we go. Senator McCory votes yes. Thank you. Warren Bello. Representative Warren Bello votes yes. Oh, sorry, I'll do it again. Representative Warren Bello votes yes. Thank you. Palm. Rep Palm votes yes. Rosario. Rep Rosario votes yes. Santiago. Representative Santiago votes yes on the bill. Slap. Senator Slap votes yes. Representative Fishbein. Offset, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I say the votes we held open at 6 o'clock tonight. We got a section four, the agenda, announcement time, and date of the next meeting. We have next kind of uh, Meeting for this committee of public hearing. Public hearing next Wednesday, March 10th at, at 1 p.m. Seeing no further comments or questions, the, the committee will send a recess until 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 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 Good night. Good night. See everybody. <laughs> Have a great day, guys. You too, Rob. Thanks. Do we have to leave, man? Because the door is still open. I'm sorry, Representative, can you repeat your question? I think we have to leave the meeting, correct? The meeting's got to stay open till six? Yeah, I'm going to stay here. Okay. Yes. I'll call you, man. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Valentina, are you good? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for Valentina. And Jenna, you too. Even thank though. We've never actually gotten to meet you. Sorry, Jenna. But thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thanks, Jenna. <laughs> Have a good weekend. You you too. Bye bye.
Senator, hi, are you there? Hello? Hello? Hi, yes, you keep, you kept getting kicked out. Um, uh, you missed the vote on Senate Bill 901, Jeff, to the floor. How would you like to vote, Senator? Yes, yes. Okay. You are all right. Thank you. Thank you, have a good day.
Hi, Representative. Hi, how are you? I, I was just, um, I'm just texting them saying I couldn't get in. Sorry, got it. Uh, all right. Um, you want to sh shoot me when I'm supposed to be? All right. So you missed the phone. Let me put the headphones on so I can hear you. Okay. How's that? That's better. First one is House Joint Resolution 59, JF to the floor. Uh, no. Uh, what about the amendments? Those, uh, uh, the voting for those has been closed. I already called the tally. Okay, even though not everybody voted on them? Yeah, I called the tally. Okay, I just yeah. didn't know if that was procedurally proper. But Okay, so no on 59, uh, no on 901, and um, yes on 6464. Yes, on 6464, no on 901, and no on House Joint Resolution 59. Yes, so, so okay. no, nothing got amended. It's it's the language that we have, correct? Uh, the first one we had JFS to the floor, but you yeah. already voted on that. You were present when that vote occurred. Yeah, the, um, other, the other three were as proposed originally. JF to the floor, yes, correct. Great. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, you're all set, Representative. Have a good day. You too, bye-bye. Thank you.